All right, folks, this is Rob with our special guest, Jeffrey Rose, um, alongside Lucas and Hunter. And yeah, we're actually doing this. We're going to be interviewing um, a, a very unique t type of work in regards to the Arabian Peninsula. And I'm just going to quickly read a, a quick bio of our guest. Um, this is from Academia. So Jeff Rose is an archaeologist and anthropologist specializing in the prehistory of the Arabian Peninsula and surrounding regions. His areas of interest touch upon a variety of subjects, including modern human origins, neolithization, stone tool technology, archaeogenetics, rock art, geoarchaeology, geo and on it goes. And um, yeah, over the past three decades, Jeff has conducted archaeological fieldwork in Illinois, Wales, Ukraine, Israel, Portugal, Yemen, and Qatar, and Oman. And so his discoveries have been featured on documentary series in the BBC, PBS, SBS Australia. So I'm in Australia at the moment, and the National Geographic. So um, let me just first start off by saying that this ministry, which really it's not really like a ministry it's more of a like a hobby sort of thing young young guys in our 20s and 30s we're also an academic we're, we're in school we're in, in, in an academic sort of context as well and as christians we absolutely make sure that the first thing that the, the most important thing is the scientific method and peer review so we're not basically young of creationists we hold to evolution um and we what we're trying to do is we're trying to blend um, good ancient Near Eastern scholarship of the Old Testament, specifically the things in, to do with origins, like, so you have the uh, ancient Near Eastern mythological sort of context with creation, then how does that relate with, with Genesis, the creation of God in Genesis, and then how does that relate with anything in the scientific literature, like in your literature? So, in a nutshell, that's who we are, and Scholars like science scholars like Hugh Ross, the astrophysicist. I don't know if you know about him, but he has used your work in this 2014 book he published called Navigating Genesis. Wow. And yeah, so, and in fact, he's like, here's the diagram he's actually used where he positions the Garden of Eden um, in the specific, specifically the location where you dubbed it as a Persian Gulf oasis. So before we get into the, those details, just give your give a overview of who you are. And uh, yeah, that, you know, we were briefly offline just then. We were talking about your, the evolution of your work, so maybe you can go through that. And sure. then we'll, we'll just go straight ahead and go into all the details after that. So go, go for it. Uh Okay, um, I'm, I'm Jeff Rose. I am an archaeologist, anthropologist. Um, I started off in, in Bible studies years and years ago when I was in, in late high school in, in, in university. So when I was 19, 20, 21, I was going off to Israel and thought I was going to be a biblical archaeologist. Uh, I was always fascinated uh, by these. The, I'm Jewish, so I grew up going to Hebrew school. And so I would, you know, so, so three times a week, I was having to go in for a second round of class in school, getting hit with all the stories of the Bible and the Torah. And, um, I took to the really old stories. I, I've always just gone older and older and older, but I took to, to Genesis and to Exodus in particular and just had this itch, uh, even, as, even when I was young. Uh, what's, the, what's the story behind these stories? Are they real? To what extent do they address our origins? And um, I think this was just sort of burning away in the back of my mind. As, and you know, I grew up and gravitate, got into archaeology um, when I was young and gravitated towards stone tools, gravitated toward prehistory. So after doing biblical archaeology at university for about three, four, five years, I got real sick of it because I, the people who were working at the sites in Israel uh, I just couldn't see any big questions that needed to be answered. There was nothing juicy out there uh, to sink my teeth into, whereas Southern Arabia was suddenly opening up. So the, the territories of Yemen and Oman, 
Um, and it, it wasn't anything to do with the Bible. And at that point, I wasn't religious at all. I, mean, I, I don't consider myself particularly religious. Um, and I thought, you know what? Forget this biblical archaeology stuff. I'm going to go to Southern Arabia, and I'm going to work on this question of human origins. Uh, at this time, so this was, we're talking 1997, 1998. So it was just around the human genome being cracked open for the first time, and, and this bombshell right. of a realization. You know, when I was, when I first got into graduate school, so 93, 94, there was this debate about multi-regional versus out of Africa versus single origins versus multiple origins. And I mean, that was, it was, you know, still an open question. We had no idea about interbreeding between species. And, um, and in the late nineties, sure enough, the, the first study started, started pouring in that, yes, we come from a single ancestral population. Uh, but at some point, something changed and they left Africa and, and became who we are today. And I think it's easy looking back and saying, this is this was my interest, but I don't know at the time I was just following uh, where I could, where I could go and make the biggest impact um, and have the biggest um, contribution. And, and you know, Arabia was just wide open. But looking back, I think what, what really attracted me to the Arabian Peninsula, what I think is, is so interesting about this subject, is this was the kindergarten of our species to use the, you know, to follow along with everyone calling Africa the cradle of the species. Yeah, sure. I, I think there's uh, ample evidence to, to, to support that. But the kinder, when we became human in a, in a cultural sense, in a behavioral sense, um, that's the Arabian Peninsula. And so to understand who we are as a species, why we are where we are today, why we're suffering so much, why we are um, really facing down the end of times in a, in a geological tipping point sense. Um, to understand that, you've got to go to the Arabian Peninsula and see what happened during those first few you know, tens of thousands of years of modern humans being in Arabia. And what was it about those particular people that made them different and um, distinguish them from the rest of humans on earth at the time. And, and, and we're still carrying that baggage forward. Uh, so that's what got me interested in Southern Arabia. And now we're in about 2000, 2001. Uh, I was doing a master's degree at the time and went to Yemen. I got a, a grant to work in Yemen for six months. So three months it was studying Arabic. And then a few months, I was out in the eastern province of Mahra, which is um, just actually over the border of where I work now in southern Oman. Um, and, and that was my first taste of this uh, world that, that n even today, nobody fully quite grasps the importance of this, this location in southern Arabia. Um, but that was my first taste of it. And then 2001, uh, everything kind of fell apart uh, after 9-11. And, and so I, I quickly shifted gears to work into Oman and um, went through my dissertation. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget, I was, uh, I had written an entire book, of, which we were talking about before we went live, about how everything is now wrong. And that was in 2006. This is when I, I published my dissertation. But I was defending the dissertation, and this was about human migration out of Africa, and the timing, and who left, and where they left from, and why they left. And, I mean, we had a, a bit right, but, but quite a bit wrong. And, and somebody in my dissertation defense, it was one of, one of my colleagues, asked me, well, what about crossing the, the, the Persian Gulf? What about people going across that side? And... I'm embarrassed to admit, I hadn't really looked carefully at the bathymetry of the Gulf. I hadn't I just hadn't given, I, I wasn't that worried about what happened after people went, went east beyond Arabia. I just wanted to get them into Arabia. And, um, and so I went home and looked at the bathymetry. Went, oh my God, this is 60 meters deep, 40 meters deep. The, the gulf wasn't there. And when you factor in hydrology, when you factor in the, the, the bathymetry of, of that emergent um, shelf, so just, like it's, just quickly for the audience, what is bathymetry? Bathymetry is the, basically, if you were to look down at the, and, and remove all the water, and you were to look down at the seabed, and looking at the contours of the seabed. 
So when you when you look down at the the contours of the seabed of the Gulf, it's 60 meters deep. And during the last ice age, you have the sea level exceeding 100, 120 meters lower than it is today, which means that at the time that Arabia was at its driest, harshest, most inhospitable, not, not just Arabia, the entire world, uh, if we're talking numbers here between, say, about 28,000 and 15,000 years ago, it was hell on earth. Um, I mean, just absolutely the food supply dropped off. We had to figure out ways of feeding ourselves. Uh, we had to become better at, um, well, where we settled, first of all. So, so instead of enjoying this, this nomadic roaming existence on these, these rolling plains, suddenly people are funneled into these, these coastal areas where, where it's the remaining sources of fresh water. It really comes down to fresh water and in all, you know, it, it, it's, it's basic and it's, um, it, it's not very, uh, um, uh, you know, interesting, <laughs> it's, it, but, but it comes down to where's the water and, and right. the, the, the more water, the more fresh water, the more people. And, and, and for that reason, there's, it's no wonder that the most important God of, of the Sumerians who, you know, is mm -hmm. going to play a role in all the biblical stories later on mm -hmm. is Enki, the God yeah. of fresh water who lives in the underground spring, who lives in the Apsu. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and that goes right in line with the, this second verse, actually, of Genesis 1. Yeah. So the whole yeah. Tiamat Apsu you know, thing with the, with the chaotic waters. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah. And, 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 and I, I love that you brought that up because there is this, there's a beauty um, in seeing the full tapestry. You know, it's one thing to have the one set of texts within the Torah, but then it's another thing you know, with the flood story, I love the flood story because it's, it's, it's probably, I was talking to somebody earlier today about this. It's probably the most heavily reported event, you know, it, it, journalistic event in, in human <laughs> history. You know, it did happen yeah. um, within a limited area, but it, 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 it makes it into so many traditions. And, and my favorite part about the Gulf story is if you take the, the, the two main traditions, one being the Abrahamic tradition of the Gulf story and the, and the second being the, the Mesopotamian, Sumerian, Akkadian version of the Gulf story. Mm -hmm. And everything up until that point, up until whether it's Zeusudra or Atrahasos or Noah, you know, whatever you call the character, there's, there's 10 generations, 10 kings, 10 somethings. Mm -hmm. Like the then Sumerian kings. Yep. Exactly. It's ex yep. you know, it, it, it then follows the same. So you can almost imagine that up until the flood, that this was a unified. Uh, I, I don't want to use the word civilization, but culture group is kind of a safe, wishy-washy word to use. So <laughs> it, you know, it is sense that they're and I, I unified in that they're sharing the same stories. They are, um, you know, we are we are cultural transmitters. I'm going to keep coming back to that point over and over and over again. That's what we do. We transmit culture. Uh, we transmit lessons from the past and, and, and hopefully are able to receive those lessons future generations down the line. Um, um, but when you take that flood story and you look at these two real streams of perspective on the story, it's, it's fascinating that on, in, in the Sumerian version, at the end of the story, the, you know, Noah Ziasudra is washed away. He's forgotten. He's flushed down the toilet. And then the story picks up again with, with um, uh, the kingship comes down again to Kish, to the city, Sumerian city-state of mm, Kish. And, right. and then so we, we begin again the, the Sumerian dynasties. Or we're, Now we're going into, into uh, the, the earliest dynasties. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you take the, 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 the Abrahamic account, it's the other side of the story. The people that got washed away um, in the southern Gulf, I would argue. Mm -hmm. that, um, that the, so, so when now putting this up into the archaeology, so pegging this to, to, to what we know archaeologically, we have the Ubaid people, the Ubaid culture. The Ubaid culture, I, I, I would argue, is synonymous with people of Noah, um, that you, you can use those two concepts interchangeably. And the Ubaid culture is what arises around, um, well, we see it in southern Mesopotamia, the oldest Ubaid sites, are at Eridu, um, which is in southern Iraq, a site called Tel El Oweli, which is also in southern Iraq, and an island off of Abu Dhabi called Marawa. So these are the three sites which have Ubaid zero um, 
uh, what's called Ubaid Zero type pottery, and that dates to about 8,500 years ago. Uh, or 6500 BC, or okay. something like that. Yeah, very so the, okay. yep. the Obeyed are the Obeyed are fast. I mean, this this was really the the, the heart of that Gulf paper that I published, um, mm -hmm. because the Obeyed what, what what makes them so so compelling is that they are a leap forward in a geographic location where we've never seen this before. So they 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 live in permanent structures that are square. Now, you know, in Neolithic terms, when people live in square houses, that's a big deal. That means that socially they've advanced to, to a more complex level of social organization. They're living in extended family units. Um, you know, we can squeeze all this information out of architectural styles um, right. and just from knowing what we know about other places in the world. So there's a anonymously, an anonym, anonymously. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Anom anomalously, uh, advanced society shows up uh, around the Persian Gulf right at the time the sea level comes up, and they're they're the world's first long distance seafarers, where they're 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 um, building reed boats coated mm -hmm. in bitumen, sailing them from Kuwait to Qatar to Bahrain to all the way down to the, to the Masandam Peninsula. Um, around Um al in, in the United Arab Emirates. So that's a thousand kilometers up and down the, the Gulf, um, trading pearls, trading cattle. And, and when you contextualize all of the, the, the civilization within the flood story, um, it begins to make more sense why there's this em uh, emphasis, for instance, on animals. What is it about, you know, two by mm. two animals? Mm. Okay, dig further back from the, from the two by two animals in Genesis and you end up in, um, there's nothing about two by two in, in the Atrahasis accounts or, or Gilgamesh or uh, the Eridu Genesis. But in these older accounts, they, may, they specifically say the beasts of the field. And I also, I think um, I, I'm in no way a biblical scholar. So double check me on this, but I think that Genesis is also Pretty, when you read it again, if you go back and look at, I think in chapter six or seven or eight, they're pretty emphatic about cows and then yeah. everything else. Yeah. So yeah. the cows are in there and, the, and, 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 and we have to be reminded of the fact that this is the oldest cattle herding civilization in the world or society in the world. Uh, that's a fact. That is uh, yeah. cattle herding starts around 10,000 years ago uh, where, where they begin to, to look at animals and go, hey, wait a minute. We can put a fence around them and 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 have a, and, and and have an amazing source of milk and protein, yeah. um, a high calorie source of milk and protein, and and that's the beginning of this division as well within the the Middle East, within the Arabian Peninsula, where you've got some people gravitating toward um, animal husbandry mm. and, and specifically cattle domestication, and then you've got another group who's sticking with the plants. And you, so you don't, for instance, in, in, in Levant, um, Neolithic Jericho, uh, uh, Beta, um, you know, sorry for the That's noise good. outside, uh, at, these, at these Neolithic sites in Levant, you don't see cattle domestication. You don't see um, an economy focused on cows. But in the Arabian Peninsula, you do. From the earliest Neolithic, you, you don't have agriculture, but you've got cattle. So what we're working on right now is um, looking at, for instance, the lactase persistence, the, the ability to digest milk, which mm -hmm. is a, a, a sign of um, where civilizations, uh, milk, where they domesticated cows. So, so the two main cattle domestication areas in the world, there's what's called per lactase persistence 13910, which everybody in Europe um, starts off Southeastern Europe and about six, seven, eight thousand years ago, and then just like dominoes um, heads toward UK and and everybody in that territory. If you you're a sample, you get sixty, seventy percent of the population that can drink milk because they have this this mutation where their body has actually um, the, the mechanism that shuts off the ability to digest the, the sugars, the lactase sugars from milk, where that 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 shuts off. In our natural forms, we should not be able to drink milk. Um, it's the mutants. I, I always say this to, to, to students in class. It's the mutants who can drink milk, um, and, and and because it was such a mind-bogglingly useful mutation, where you can get so many extra calories um, in an arid environment where you don't have a dependable source of water throughout the year. Um, yeah. You've you've got a source of liquid. You've got a source of you know you you, you take the refrigerator with you. 
um, in a sense. And, right. um, so the second major mutation is called 13915. And everybody in the Middle East has this. And we find it in the highest percentages in, in the area where I work, in Dofar, in southern Oman, uh, and also eastern Yemen. So we're playing with this potentially crazy but also revolutionary idea that there were two halves of the Neolithic Revolution. We've been focused on the Neolithic Revolution of the northern Fertile Crescent. Mm -hmm. But in fact, at the same time, there was, a ne there was another Neolithic Revolution happening in the southern Fertile Crescent. Um, and that was focused on the domestication of animals and, and mm. the focus specifically on, on cattle herding, on, on cattle society. Mm. And now where that comes from sort of leads me to um, this latest bit of research in the, in, the, in the book that I just wrote, which is bringing the Quran in, into the story. Oh, okay. And, in and what, like in what's mentioned in the Quran or are you talking Islamic sort of data? What, so, Oh. So what I, I okay so so yeah. I, I I wrote this Gulf article. Let me back up now. Two thousand. Okay, no, no, no. yeah, go for and, it. And, go and, for and, it. And, and I wrote this Gulf article, yeah. and somehow, and I and, and, and uh, this whole story was a, a introduction was a way of, of telling you how I never intended to back into any of this um, into this work, re reinvestigating or reinterpreting any of the Bible. You're right. <laughs> um, I, was, I was running away from 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 the, you know the field of biblical archaeology at the time, yep. and then suddenly I'm looking at the flood story, and I'm looking at the I'm looking at an incredibly fertile landscape, which which I call a demographic refugium, at the headwaters of the Tigris and the Euphrates nine thousand years ago, um, at a time when the Indian Ocean monsoon was pushing far north into you know as far north as the headwaters of the Tigris and the Euphrates. Mm -hmm. um, at a time when, when you even have the, the Indian Ocean monsoon, it creates a cloud forest. It, 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 it's, it's not the monsoon in the sense of, you know, torrential downpours like you'd get in India. It's the monsoon more like whales every day of the year, you know, just okay. thick, foggy, rainy, drizzly. Um, that's the monsoon. And, and, and that creates a specific ecosystem called, the, called a cloud forest. So there you have it, Genesis, of, you know, the land at the confluence of the Tigris and Euphrates, where you have the mists from the deep coming up mm -hmm. and watering the land. And well, there's your mist from, I mean, every little bit of geog geography ticks all the boxes for explaining this, this story. And is, there a, is there an aquifer in the Arabian Peninsula? Like so a... the, yeah, I mean, there is a major, major aquifer that, that it, so far, okay, let, let, let's, um, let, let, let me back up for one yeah, second, yeah, yeah. Go since, for since we're talking about over. Yeah, yeah. The geography of the Arabian Peninsula is such that you have this Indian Ocean monsoon. And I, I just mentioned it earlier. And yeah. let, let me give it a little bit more context. It, it's because I think it's the engine for, for so much of human history, for so much of what we talk, so much of the myths we talk about. What does the key to all this? The opposite. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the water, the, the monster of the southern wind, which is right. another, it's a, the, in, the, in the Halupu tree, which is a um, wonderful Sumerian poem, mm -hmm. um, which is a metaphor for, for the Neolithic Revolution. They talk about the monster of the southern wind coming and plucking up the, the tree and then scattering its, you know, all, all its different parts along the Euphrates, um, which the monster of the south wind are cyclones. These are these are these are, are hurricanes. These are, are which are picking up now and, and slamming again into the Arabian Peninsula. They're getting, um, I think they got six hundred millimeters of rain last year in one thirty-six hour period. Wow. Okay. Um, wow. So, um, um, so so when you are thinking about the geography of Arabia, uh, the monsoon is the most important aspect to it. So it moves clockwise annually through the Indian Ocean, and it, it hits the, um, the highlands of, the, of Ethiopia, and it feeds the Nile, which is what causes the Nile flooding every year. You know, you can set your watch to it. Uh, I think it's June 21st, the Nile begins to flood. It's right on the solstice. Uh, right. The same thing happens in Dofar, in the mountains of Dofar, which, so there's a mountain range in southern Arabia. It's the only real tall set of mountains that's exposed to the open Indian Ocean. And it gets slammed with this monsoon right today, pretty much right around the solstice. So June 20, 20th, 21st, 22nd. And mm -hmm. it lasts for three months. And for those three months, 
um, um, the southern Oman becomes tropical and it just lights up and it becomes green, emerald hills. And, uh, you know, they grow mangoes and bananas. And uh, you, you look around, you're like, am I in Puerto Rico or am I? In? And then you drive up into the hills and it's these rolling grasslands with these little uh, dwarf, they're called dwarf shorthorn cattle, which are a local um, indigenous type of cattle breed. Okay. Um, and it, it, it's this magical place. And, and as a result of these dynamics, water seeps down into the, into the mountains and, and it, it's essentially the head of the underground river. Now that underground river then drains from, um, from Dofar, from the mountains of Southern Oman, under the Rubal Khali Desert, bends around the, what's called the two acre escarpment in Saudi Arabia, which is also feeding it with, you know, it's also an area with, with elevation that's also getting moisture and getting some rainfall. So then it's fed by that. And then they both enter into the, into the Gulf underground, right around Bahrain um, and Western Abu Dhabi. Hmm. And, and as a result, I think in, in the Gulf paper, um, one of the maps, you can see there are freshwater lakes Bahrain is famous for, um, for its fresh water supply. So you, you've got these wonderful stories of Portuguese explorers sailing their way in the 16th century, 17th century, sailing their way into Hormuz and up, up the Gulf and then stopping in Bahrain and hiring locals to dive down under the ground, uh, I'm sorry, under the sea and mm. fill up their canteens with, with fresh water and refill all their fresh water supplies mm. because there is fresh water pouring out of the bottom of the Gulf because of these aquifers. Now, the reason that's significant um, biblically in, in terms of the narrative we see in Genesis and, and, and also in, in all of the flood stories is this is an area of springs. So when you, when you imagine you're playing with a garden hose, you know, and you're a kid and you've got a, you've got a garden hose filled with, with, with water and, and you're holding both ends on either hand and you, and you drop one end, the other end starts to bubble up. And the mm -hmm. reason for that is because you've increased what's called the hydrostatic pressure. Mm -hmm. Now, the same thing, exact same thing happens during the last ice age. So at the time when the, when the sea levels are lower, when the Gulf is, when there's no rainfall over the Arabian Peninsula, when the monsoon, which, which I was talking about earlier, when that monsoon is, is, is died off and is, is no longer watering the Arabian Peninsula at all, mm -hmm you've increased the hydrostatic pressure on all the aquifers in the Gulf. So, there, the, so it's a land of these bubbling springs. So this is why it becomes a, a place of refuge. This is why it is so significant for populations in that critical period between, say, 28, 20,000 uh, years ago, when, when the rest of the, I mean, this is what we need to get our, head around, our heads around, and, and, and the genetics bear this out. The world was, was, was a desert with a few puddles of human habitation. And the biggest puddle of all was in the Gulf um, for that reason. And so the fact that we're still now telling the story of, of the Gulf in, in, a, in a very roundabout way, it's not so surprising because when you think about all the different traditions that survived within that region and um, just as they passed on their genes. So if we look at this genetically, okay, if we look at this, we, you know, let, let me shift gears completely now Go for and, it. And, and superimpose all maternal diversity in the world. Mm -hmm. So if we take the female, uh, and, I, and I say maternal female because we look at the mitochondria as, as one of the, the key bits of evidence, and, and you can look at the Y chromosome as another key bit. And when we look at that, we see there are three branches. One of those branches, the most significant branch, is R. So there's M, N, and R. Mm -hmm. L3 is the founding population, who I would argue are the, they're the first modern humans to leave the Nile Valley, to, to come into southern Arabia around 80, 90, or 100,000 years ago. They survive for 70,000 years and in the Arabian Peninsula. And in the meantime, there are little bits branching off here and there. So there's one group called haplogroup M, and mm -hmm. M, M becomes the, the, the founding population for all of Asia. Um, then there's haplogroup N, which becomes the founding population for all of Europe. And then there's R, which is India and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And the sort of million-dollar question is, well, where's R0? Where's the base of R? 
if, if each one of these branches represents a place we were bottlenecked, a place that we got cut off and survived as one small population before the environment that improved and, and, and allowed us to, to grow again and, and, to, and to fluoresce into different mm-hmm. branches. So R, you know, the million dollar question was where is R and R could be the Gulf. And, and if that's the case, then uh, because the first farmers are, are descended from R, the first, uh, you know, the, first, the Natufian farmers of the Levant, um, the, the, the first herders, the first, uh, you know, and, and this applies to, to everyone um, radiating outward from this nexus. So from the Gulf, you get into the Zagros Mountains, you get into uh, Pakistan, Kashmir, India, you yep. get into Southern Arabia. So this is sort of this hub region that then spills out its genetics and, and I would argue, spills out its, its memes, it spills out its stories, um, which I, I just, guess is... Just, it, just quickly, the Toba eruption uh, in Indonesia uh, about 70,000 years ago, so obviously this is a Pleistocene sort of situation. It, it, uh, I've, I have papers, like there's one called the Pleistocene Climate Change in Arabia, developing a framework for hominin dispersal over the last 350,000 years. And in that, they, they speak about how, um, uh, well, this is my, because I, I made a lecture on my YouTube about my model for Noah's Flood using your work and a few other work. And, and I summarize the paper by saying, here we see a paleoclimatic record-based oxygen isotope stages where most interesting is the direct correlation of arid conditions at stage four. So this is in the graph yeah. coinciding with the supervolcanic Toba eruption. And, and then they've, they spoke about this bottlenecking is, is that sort of what you're getting at? Or are you talking about the bottlenecking that's much later on? No, no, that, that's exactly the bottlenecking. That, that, okay. that, that's, okay. that, that, that event that happens, um, you know, the first modern humans come out and then they get bottlenecked. And it's after the, in the bottleneck, and we've been arguing about it for years, where was that bottleneck? Was it in mm-hmm. Arabia? Was it in Africa? Um, and what I, would, what I would argue, and I think what, what the evidence we're finding in Dofar, is that South Arabia is the key, is this lost refugium because of the monsoon, because it's constantly being watered by these rains. And what we're, this is why we find a, an ice age population from 30,000 years ago, from the height, or going into the height of the last glacial maximum. Mm-hmm. Um, what we discovered with in, 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 the problem is we don't have dates, but what we've discovered with the, the Nubian complex. So the Nubian complex is the culture group that, that we discovered left Africa and came to Arabia. So, mm-hmm. so early on when I was talking about my dissertation research, I, I had written an entire book about migration out of Africa. And I didn't use the word Nubian complex one time because it never <laughs> occurred to me that, that these guys might be the ones uh, that had left Africa and that had populated the Arabian Peninsula. These might be our, our modern humans. I mean, so p- part of what people need to understand, I think, and, and including myself, as I've had to come to terms with, is that when we talk about early modern humans, and mm-hmm. the world, I call it Middle Earth, <laughs> during the Middle Paleolithic. Because <laughs> yeah. very, it is very Tolkien-esque. Yeah, yeah. Um, there wasn't a single modern human population that then went on. And in, in, there was lots of modern human populations, but there was one in particular, I would argue, there mm-hmm. was one in particular that had an edge. And that is these Nubian complex guys. And that is their tool-making style and everything that, that goes with that tool-making style. So um, what we've also learned, and let me, let me throw this in here. It's mm-hmm. just to really confuse things, but because I love this subject so much. I, is I'm thoroughly they, enjoying this, by the way. So, yeah. I, 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 I don't know about everyone else listening, but because, as long as I've got one. <laughs> so far, what you've d- shared is, believe it or not, I'm not making this, this up. I'm not a specialist in your area. I'm I'm more in the physics background, math and engineering background. Um, I guess you could say I b- because I've been in acad- like an, in an academic sort of framework for 
the last 10 years. So I'm 31 at the moment. So I started university around 21 and I've been, I've stretched it out for, for that long and I'm still in that mode, so to speak. So I know what to look for when it comes down to peer review. Um, and so when I, I, I just have this, and I became a Christian in 2000, uh, uh, 2010. So when I was 21, that's when I became a Christian. And then I was looking at the whole Christian and Old Testament stuff just purely through an academic sort of context. So when I, everything you shared so far, I guess you could say, sort of, it literally drives with the educational guesswork, like my con like I'm conjecturing. It's like, okay, I'm not a special in this. Based on what I'm reading here, I could sort of see, okay, and then, and then this other scholar is also saying this independently. And, and then when I made that PowerPoint and I kind of put all the pieces together and I just said, here's a hypothesis of what I think Noah's flood is with relative to the his historical context of human migration and all that, there seems to be a lot of coherence. Um, so that's that's what I'm going to get into after you've fleshed out what you're saying. I'll start to like share with what I've put together and then I, I have you critique it. Like I literally have you go, you got that <laughs> right and you got that wrong. Like, you know. Okay. But yeah. I mean, I, I mean yeah. with the caveat that I'm, I'm always critiquing myself. So I've, I, I actually don't agree with some of the things I said in that, in that sure. golf paper that yeah. I keep referring to. I are, you talk, around... are you talking about the 2010 paper? Yeah. The, 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 yeah, the, yeah. Okay. That was the one where I really just decided, look, I need to, I need to stop dancing around this thing and just yeah. address it head on. Um, and, um, at the time, I, I was much more interested. I was thinking about the flood. I should have been thinking much more about the Eden side of things, the Dilmun side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the fact that this is the the ancestral homeland for for such a large portion of the population. The genetics weren't quite there yet, so I didn't have the, I suppose, the confidence to keep pushing it. And, and we had no archaeological evidence of anyone around the Gulf at the time. Um, I but think just. Just before I, I butt in, and I think you were talking about uh, you were going to you're going to throw in a little more confusing thing. Yes, the uh, basal. Okay, so yeah, the, yeah. the term. Let me throw out the term basal Eurasians. Okay. Um, basal Eurasians. I so I'd written this golf paper and kind of stuck my neck out. And I said somewhere, I think toward the end of the paper, the point of this is is to propose and introduce a new cast of characters um, that are part of the human story that have been lost and, and it, it, it didn't, it was all very vague at the time and we didn't know very, we didn't know much. What we've since discovered is that the Nubian comp, so at the time we had only just, for, I think I, the paper was published while we were in the process of finding the Nubian complex. And so I kind of knew, I had an inside scoop that, that human origins was about to get pushed back um, several thousand years, but, um, what we then discovered is that they stayed in Arabia, at least one group of them did, and they adapted. And we know this because what we find at these sites, we, we have yet to really publish this in full. Uh, we're working on this now. But what we have, what we find are these incredible workshop sites, where stone tool workshop sites, because first of all, Oman has not just fresh water, um, but it's got flint coming out the wazoo and, and you know, high oh, quality, okay. really high quality flint. Wow. And as, as we as humans get complex and as we, as we start moving toward the upper Paleolithic and the later middle Paleolithic, we start getting a lot pickier about the kind of raw material we're going to use. So instead of just using, you know, grabbing the nearest quartzite or you know, coarse grain limestone, solicit, it, it, they want the good stuff. They want fine grain flint or chert or obsidian. So this has, this then has a lot to do with where we find these types of populations because they're going to stick around places where they can create the best equipment. It's like oil, you know. They're going to, right. they're going to go where, 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 and this is what powers their civilization. And I said right at the, at the top of this, um, what interests me about studying the first humans is what does it tell us about who we are. Uh, and, and what I can say is that when you compare the, the toolkit 
of these these first these Nubian hunters, mm-hmm. these Nubian people. Um, and Nubian, I should I should say also, is nothing to do with modern Nubia. It, it, it's a terrible, unfortunate naming problem from the '60s um, when it, the, the stuff was first found in Nubia during the. Um, when they were building a dam and, and everything was going underwater. So UNESCO had this. Made. So, so when I say Nubia, I, I don't want to necessarily suggest that we're talking about modern Nubians. Mm-hmm. Um, but when this Nubian complex, when this culture group, when it comes into Arabia, it begins to adapt and it, and it begins to change. And instead of these hunters, which are sticking by the rivers, um, and, you know, they're not fishermen, they're not, they're not moving along beaches, they're not hugging the coastlines, they're staying by the fresh water, they're staying in the interior, they're hugging the, and they're hunting big things like bison and um, aurochs, uh, wild cattle. Um, mm-hmm. Pale- Paleoxidon is my favorite, which is the, um, these, these enormous sort of giant elef- straight tuck tusked elephants. It, again, it's like Middle Earth, so you're straight out of <laughs> Tolkien's o- o- Oliphants. Right. Um, so you know, that's what they're taking down. And when you see the Nubian points, which are what makes it so interesting is it's, it's the technology you find in the Nile Valley is identical to the technology you find in, in the Arabian Peninsula in the south of Arabia. And, and it's these huge spear points. And these are not hurled. You know, nobody is throwing these things because they're not going to go very far. They'll probably just you know, fall straight away. Right. Um, these are thrust. And it's... A, what we find is that at these workshop sites that, that the Nubians will come back to over and over again for tens of thousands of years, we find really old artifacts that are heavily weathered. You can see they've been sitting on the surface, exposed to the elements. They've become chemically dis, uh, dis, um, dissolved. The, mm-hmm. the edges are battered you know, all these. And then you find a fresh or somewhat fresh um, piece lying next to it, which is clearly not as old. But it uses the same technology, but shrunken down. And so now they're producing exactly the same kind of a tool uh, using the same process. But instead of a giant spear point, they're now you know, making these tiny little um, um, ar- you know, armatures, for lack of a better word. So, so, ge- and, so geometrically, the shapes are the, like the, the proportions are still the same. It's just the proportions are more the same. Fine but the, the key the, the key is that the technology is the same and and okay. and, and people you know, this is this is probably the, the first concept um, I, I should introduce is that prehistoric technology is there are millions of ways to skin a cat so to speak or to, or to, <laughs> okay. or to, right. um, well actually no, right. I, let, let me rephrase that there's one way to skin a cat but there's millions of ways to make the scraper to do it right and and, and so tools people often think tools are what's interesting for for uh, archaeologists and it's not tools at all it's the the steps that went into making the final product and so that and, and and that's what tells us that's language that has to be taught from one generation to the next and this is why stone tools are are in any way informative because there's nothing intuitive about making a tool you, you know this is culturally transmitted behavior this is why we get we get so excited about stone tools um, is not because it's, oh, they were eating meat. It's because, oh, they were speaking this type of language. Mm. Uh, and so that's, how, and that's what enabled us to be able to look at this, this African technology um, that, that was only known from the Nile Valley up until we started finding this stuff in, in, in Oman in 2010. Um, and, and so, like I said, what we discovered is that these people survive to make much smaller type of, of I'm desperately trying to avoid using the word arrowhead because it's, they're not bows and arrows, um, but they are a kind of a spear point. And um, since you're Australian, I, I don't know how many other listeners are Australian, but we had, when we did this one special for SBS Australia, mm-hmm. uh, we had a guy called Ernie Dingo, who is um, sort of a local Australian celebrity and, yep. and He's Aboriginal and invited him out to the site. And we, we, had, we had a few different you know, sort of famous Australians. They were tracing their, their ancestry back uh, to when they were all part of the same population. Mm-hmm. So Ernie's going through and he's looking at these and he's grown up with stone tools. 
And so, and, and he was the one who planted the idea in my head when I'm showing him that, you know, first you have these giant Nubian points and then you have these tiny little, he goes, ah, well, in Australia, we use what's called a woomera, which is uh, essentially a spear thrower. He goes, yeah, we're using a woomera. These guys are, that's about right, right size. I think they're using woomeras. <laughs> so he was, the rest of the day, he was going on and on about how the woomera, woomera uh, works. But I think he was right. And, and so hats off to him for, for that tip, because w this tells us a, a lot of things. First of all, they were smart enough um, to adapt to the changing climate. So you mentioned Toba. Mm -hmm. They're, they are in the Arabian Peninsula well before the Toba eruption. And whether or not Toba had a direct impact on Arabia, it's certainly the, the climate by 70,000 years ago is on its way down. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, you've had this... 50,000 year on and off period of just paradise, uh, strong rainfall throughout the entire Arabian Peninsula, all the way up into Jordan, lakes in Jordan, lakes all over the, the deserts of Saudi. Um, just, just, really, quickly, when, just quickly, when would you put the upper limit? So what year or how many years ago would you say that humans get into the Persian Gulf or this Arabian into, so I, I think that they're in the Arabian Peninsula um, 130,000 years ago. Okay. Um, the Gulf, I think, this is one of the fights I have with. There's another famous site called Jebel Faya, which is around the Gulf. And they, 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 the, the excavators, a team from Germany, have argued that they're modern humans. And I've argued that, no, 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 this is an archaic population. These are mm -hmm. some sort of Neanderthals that are living around the the Gulf and it's okay. they're they're displaced by modern humans at a later date possibly um, but I, I the Gulf isn't fully exposed until 70,000 years ago so okay. you have to imagine that there's a, a seesaw effect almost going on in the Arabian Peninsula so at times when the monsoon is strong and there's rainfall over the desert it's also a time when the sea level is high and so there's no access to this you know, magical landscape in the Gulf mm -hmm. Conversely, period between, say, 70,000 and 60,000 years ago, and then again between 28 and 15,000 years ago, these are the, the glacial maxima. These are the really dry periods when the rainfall cuts out, but then the sea level drops. So there's this pushing and pulling mechanism that's drawing hunter-gatherers out into the grasslands um, when, when, when it's fertile, and then pulling them back into these oases type of, of areas when mm -hmm. the going gets tough. Now, unfortunately or unfortunately, what happens after the 28,000 to 14,000 year ice age, the last ice age, mm -hmm. we got too smart for our own good. And, and, and this is where I would, I would say that the, the, the knowledge of, of the, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil uh, the lote tree, the halupu tree, whatever, whatever you want to call it in whichever tradition from this region, mm -hmm. this, is, this is what that's referencing, is, is why everything just goes to hell, is because... So what, what's the side effects of this particular plant? Um, well, it's, it's not a particular plant. It's, it's oh, the right. Neolithic revolution in general. It's the changing attitude of, oh, okay. of our species... Yeah, okay. Thought, okay. toward the earth so I, i'm thinking of this as a me in metaphorical terms so so my my you know quick and easy quick and dirty um answer to to the right. forbidden fruit is that we we one season the natufians decided to be a little bit lazy and decided maybe we maybe we'll just try planting this in, instead of getting up and getting off our butts and going somewhere else and it worked really well because the climate was just banging during this period. You know, the climate was, it was so fertile. So what you have is high landscape carrying capacity. And this term, which is, it's, it's a sort of a technical term, but it's so important. It, it just roughly means how much biomass is there on the landscape to eat? Right, right. How much work do you have to put into getting at that, at that food? And therefore, how many people can you support using the known technology that you have? And this is where they got themselves into trouble because, and, and we know this from recent discoveries, Gobekli Tepe, um, where they hadn't actually oh, yeah, become yeah, yeah. full, they hadn't become mm -hmm. full-blown farmers um, before going into, sedentization is the first step. And then 
you end up with the domesticated cereal grains, and then you end up with disease because settlements become disease vectors. Malnourishment, we go from 5'10 in height, uh, you know, 178 centimeter average for males, down to 150 two centimeter right. average and height for males and, all through the ancient Near East as the average height like and i mean that and that continues straight on through into the early 20th century throughout the entire right. world uh, among you know uh, farming agricultural based societies mm -hmm. um, you you do have one little spike in the roman empire which is interesting but in general when you look at, at global heights we were tiny up until the the 20th century um, and, so, and, and, and so the the outlier would be Goliath, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the Masoretic text, which is thousands of years after the Dead Sea Scrolls, has Goliath as nine feet. But the Dead sea Let's talk about giants. Feet. Right. So, but Goliath they is 6.5 the... feet in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is a more natural reading than the nine foot. So yeah. you, th th you just teed up the perfect sequitur. Um, okay. <laughs> so, and, and actually, actually you, you, bringing me back to this concept of the basal Eurasians. So I, I mentioned right. this name earlier. What we've discovered in, in, in all the genetics is that there was a population that got cut off in the Arabian Peninsula um, and isolated for tens of thousands of years. So in 2006, this is only discovered 2016, Harvard Ancient DNA Lab was looking at all of the ancient DNA recovered from, from graveyards at Natufian sites in the Middle East. Um, and then they can, and Natufians, uh, for those of you guys who don't know, are they are the first, farmers isn't right the right term, but they're the first um, um, agriculturalists. They're the first to play around with farming, um, but, it, but as a hobby, um, this was not a full-time economy for them. Uh, but they were the ones who got us into the mess we're in now. <laughs> so we, we have them to thank for it. Uh, I just wanted to quickly say your conjecture about the tree of knowledge connected to the, the metaphorical use that you just mentioned. So you're talking about a psychological sort of change going on here. Believe so, it or not, Paul actually agrees with you in the New Testament. That's what he thinks the tree of knowledge is. This is, it, this is personal. So, actually, well, to, and yeah. to be fair, I, I stole a bit of that from, I think it's in the Talmud, it's uh, Rabbi Bar Eli, I want to say, who actually, right. yep. who, who, you know, going through and, and um, comparing all the different possibilities for what the fruit is. And he says, mm -hmm. oh, it could be a grain of wheat because the word for sin and the word for wheat are kind of a play off of each other. Um, and so yeah, you know, I just, that, I just wanted to say that I, I com again, because I and, this and, is too so much of driving you. It's, it's just amazing. Yeah. It's it's part. I think it's parsimony as well. It's just it's right. it's that we we now have as a culture as we have so many pieces of the puzzle and we have so many. We are all able to to take our little pieces and put them together and see that it all fits and it doesn't. It's not um, in any way um, at odds with one another. Mm -hmm. You know, this is this is my attitude going into. Um, well, first of all, I was teaching evolution in Texas, which is which is a tall order. And so my attitude was, all right, what if we go in with everyone's right? You just have to understand their perspective and that their and their language and that the language they use to express what they're trying to express is we, we really have a, we have a hard time calibrating our language. I mean, the word God, we could have a, a five hour conversation about what that word means and, mm -hmm. um, and and just scratch the surface. So I think that. Um, you know, this is this is the problem, and this is the beauty of the Tower of Babel story. Is that mm -hmm. Language screwed us up. If we just could agree on one group of symbols, and Gobekli Tepe, the, this extraordinary site, um, you know, of these these seven meter tall carved. Have you done much pillars, work on this? Because it's still a, a huge question mark for a lot of people. It, um, it came up in my book accidentally, and, okay. and, and again, I backed into an explanation that I wasn't expecting. I stumbled on, into an explanation I wasn't expecting, but I'm, I'm kind of, I'm a, I like it. Let's put it that way. Okay, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm attached to it now. It's, and then, and it's, I think Gobekli Tepe is actually referenced in the Quran. Um, I think, in a sense, uh, it may so even be... Um, going back to that thing you mentioned earlier. Okay. Yeah. So, so let, let me tell okay, you let's, let's do the together. giant. 
because yes, there's, there's, because it, it's thing. there's just so much to talk about. It's and we're yeah. we're converging into into one. We're converging somewhere. Is okay. the good news? So the giants. The so what we what we have found. What the, 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 let's go back to the Harvard DNA lab. 2016. Right. They're looking at these skeletons from the earliest Levantine farmers, the Natufians, and comparing it to all people on earth, all the people in Europe and Asia, all the, you know, all those that left Africa. So everybody who's admixed in Africa, all of the admixture in Europe, Asia, Australia, and they're comparing all of this and they're going, okay, we have three populations we know about. One is the group of modern humans that mixed with Neanderthals. So, so they're, they're the, the Western Euro, Eurasians from the, from the ice age. They're, they're, one of the three main four main streams of all people. The second main stream is um, the group of northern Eurasians that mixed with the Denisovans, who are the you know Asian version of Neanderthals. For, for mm-hmm. to, to, to yep. um, give a, a quick and dirty explanation, and then you have the, this third stream, which is the Near Eastern farmers, and this is the most prominent by far. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, you know, as we talked about earlier, with lactase persistence, with, with goat domestication, with cattle domestication, with plant domestication, as soon as they spread into Europe, it just spreads like wildfire. Mm-hmm. And that population disting- is distinguished from the, the local uh, Mesolithic um, Stone Age population that's still you know, running around hunting. And, you know, like Otzi, the Iceman that was found in, on the border of, of mm-hmm. northern Italy. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a Mesolithic hunter living among these these you know very upper class presumably uh, well-off farmers that have come out of the near east with these fancy cows that give you milk and 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 are you know and and aren't going to gouge you when you when you walk into the uh into the pen into these domesticated cows which is a mind-boggling innovation and and there within this this very neat and orderly scheme of ancestral lineages there was a fourth population and they call it a phantom population because there is no modern they're gone they're extinct and yet they contributed to a quarter of all modern human dna they are the only population that that did not interbreed with with any archaic any other archaic species they are linked to the very first population that left africa so they are the direct descendant. They're, the name for them is basal Eurasian because they're essentially the base. If you picture this tree, um, you know, this genetic or, or physical tree of life, um, there they are at the very base. The first modern population that leaves Africa, settles in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, you know, one haplogroup, one set goes off into, into Europe. The other set goes off into Asia. And then one group just stays hold up in the Arabian Peninsula for 80,000 years. So these, now coming into our, our Neolithic period, where we have the work that I've done in, in what I call the Southern Crescent, the, the lost Southern Fertile Crescent, is we've been finding, well, first of all, we've been finding um, uh, sites dated to 30,000 years ago with advanced hunting technology. Now I can say bow and arrow with mm-hmm. advanced bow and arrow hunting technology uh, at a time when, when archaeologists never thought anyone would be in the Arabian Peninsula. I had you know, theorized they might be in the Gulf, but I never actually expected to find physical evidence of them in, in, a, in, in Dofar, in, in, in the canyon lands where I work. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we find in the same canyon lands dated to about 13,000 years ago, the oldest evidence of, of a, a, this, this cattle herding society um, at a time when they're not supposed to, again, when they're not supposed to be there, which has led us to start wondering, wait a minute, did these guys in Southern Arabia, were they the ones who domesticated cattle? Because it's, we don't know, it's, a, it's this open mystery. But the one thing I can tell you is you need grasslands. Where, where you're going to find the, the, the place of cattle domestication is where you're going to find um, the most aurochs, the highest density population of aurochs. Hmm. So what we have is this emerging picture, and, 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 and this is where everything hopefully converges, is two populations in the Near East that have adapted to two different environments 
Um, one are these animal cattle herders living off of protein and milk um, for, for at least a three or 4,000 year period when the, when the Indian Ocean monsoon was, was powerful, it was north, it turned the, the, the deserts green. And then you have this other population of technologically savvy farmers who were starting to live in villages and worship together. Um, Gobekli Tepe, that's what makes Gobekli Tepe so amazing is that they hadn't domesticated animals. There's no domesticated animals on site. These were not the animal people. These were clearly the plant people who, who you know, the things they're depicting on, on their um, pillars, on their, on their, you know, is vultures, scorpions, wolves, foxes. It's, it's not cows and goats and the things that they were eating you know, that they had been. Um, um, we don't, and then we find all this evidence for ritual feasting, but none of it domesticated, all wild. So, so this emerging picture of two groups, one five foot two, 155 centimeters, malnourished, um, agriculturalists, their, 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 their stone tool technology doesn't suggest any kind of uh, elaborate uh, killing behavior. And then you've got this other population holed up in southern Arabia in, 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 what, in the Quran, what's called the land of Allah Khaf, which is... Um, what, I, what I get into in, all the, in the book. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and the land of Allah Khaf is it, almost synonymous with, with Eden. It's the place that used to be green, it used to be a homeland, it used to be lush, and is now this, in, this, in the case of Allah Khaf, is a cursed desert. Um, and, 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 and it's fascinating that you have in the Quran, in, in folklore, in Bedlam and songs, memory of Southern Arabia being this green um, um, you know, land of, of, of springs and, and, and rivers and um, mm-hmm. you know, just as it actually was, just as we know very, very particularly that it was. So two different groups, one on protein, one on, on plants, one we know from their skeletal evidence are, are tiny. You know, we know by the late Neolithic, people have shrunk down. Mm-hmm. And if you th- and, and, and I don't know if this is obvious for, 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 for everyone. I, I actually, I didn't know this. And when I started looking into it, I always assumed height was genetic. It had something to do with population, something that has nothing to do with genetics, you know, other than in, on an individual basis, but not on population mm-hmm. genetics. It has everything to do with diet. Um, it simply has to do with how much protein. And I, I think the best example is if you look at, uh, the change in 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 um, Japanese population from mid 20th century to now, they've shot up in height because beef has been introduced as a primary source of protein into the diet. Milk has been introduced into the diet. Uh, the same thing. And in fact, I, I was I was researching some of the African, you know, the very tall African populations, which we we you know we we just associate naturally with with genetics. I did turns out that's not true at all. It's the fact that they are herders and it's actually a measure of malnourishment. Their height is because they're not, they're getting 400% of the protein they need per year, but only 75% of the calories and they're not getting it. And they're getting it intermittently throughout the year because it's an arid environment. So as a result, the growth cycles end up being longer. And so they end up with the, with this very typical frame, this gracile, long, thin frame, um, which is everything to do with the diet and, and subsistence practices. So now apply that to a situation six, seven, eight thousand years ago, when you have two groups, one who lived to tell the story, and that is the, the, the farmers, and then another group in the South who are, are essentially living in a land that's about to get doomed. Um, the Quran gives us a lot more detail about them. And it says they were increased in stature. So they could have been no more than 180 centimeters or 190 centimeters. Uh, but, but when you're five foot mm-hmm. two and you're writing about somebody who's six foot, an entire population that's six foot. Yeah. And, 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 hence, and, and, hence the Nephilim in the Old Testament, like exact, the Anakim. The, be, yeah. the, the, best one, the best one is because I think Nephilim and Anakim, they can, they're a bit vague, those terms. But there's one particular term, Zamzamim. Mm. And that one... Yeah. It, because the, the, the reason I like that one is it specifically um, is an onomatopoeia referring, it's an Akkadian word, zamzamu, 
are people who speak nonsense, who speak a nonsense buzzing, uh, you know, to, to zamzam is to make a buzzing okay. is to make a buzzing sound. Now, everything here on out. Uh, let me just caveat saying this is real conjecture from here on out. Okay. But right. the my argument is that the basal Eurasians would be would be essentially a genetic cousin to the Sumerians. They both. Uh, are derived are isolated populations that derive from in one case southern arabia and the other case the gulf oasis but these are you know these are porous populations moving back and forth we we know that sumerian is, an, is a language isolate unrelated to everything else in the near east and we know that it was a tonal language and for, to, to to make a, a to have a tonal language where, where semitic is non-tonal um, all Germanic Western languages are non-tonal. Um, Latin languages are non-tonal. Asian languages are tonal. So it means you change your pitch to change the meaning. Mm. Sumerian was a tonal language. So if these guys, these lost giants of, of Arabia, uh, Zamzamin, um, that, that I think the line in Genesis is they were there in the ancient times before the, An the Amorites, and we were... To them as locusts, and we and appeared 30, as locusts to them. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. you know, um... and and just quickly, the curious thing because there's a scholar, Michael Heiser. He's he's pretty much his dissertation, his research into the ancient areas, basically what's called the Apkalu tradition. I don't know if you know, if you're familiar with the Sumerian Apkalu. So the Apkalu. You have a anti-Diluvian Apkalu and a post-Diluvian Apkalu. These, but in in the Sumerian, or just even even not just the Sumerian, pretty much all ancient Near Eastern literature, the Apkalu would be the equivalent of the sons of God in Genesis six. That's okay. sort of intermingled with with the women, and then you have then scholars wrestling with: Are we talking about a particular human group? Which now. When you'd mentioned about that, the basal Eurasians. Yeah, the basal Eurasians. Immediately, alarm bells are going off. Like, oh my gosh! So, keeping That's, in mind, these yeah. basal Eurasians have not interbred with any other. They're the that only was, ones. That was only my who, question to you. They did they, they ever? Is, did the two groups ever meet? Uh, uh, or did they ever I, meet I, with anyone I, else? And and hence that I whole network hybrid thing. I would think they did. Um, I mean, well, in one sense, we can say that the basal Eurasians are the ancestors of these subsequent groups of all of all subsequent modern human groups. So you have this, you know, Nubian complex tool makers who leave Africa about 100,000 years ago. Uh, genetics, you can call them haplogroup L3. You can call them uh, basal Eurasians, whatever term you want to use. This group leaves Africa and ends up in the Arabian Peninsula for, for tens of thousands of years during a really uh, uh, fertile time period. Um, the going gets tough, the rug gets pulled out from end, under them, and then they end up scattering into the wind. So one group goes into the Levant, mixes with um, Neander Levantine Neanderthals. Probably in Saudi Arabia, I, I, I suspect that some of the material we're seeing in Saudi are hybrids, actually, and that the Rubal Kali is the wall that is separating populations, that's keeping one, you know, one, so essentially Saudi geographically is, is more of a, a southern extension of the Levant, mm -hmm. whereas, whereas geographically South Arabia is its own distinct unit. And linguistically, this is borne out. The, 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 the people I work with, um, they speak uh, in Dofar, they speak a, a language, South Semitic, which is which predates Hebrew and Arabic by by thousands of years. This mm. is an offshoot of Proto-Akkadian mm. uh, that ends, you know, it ends up getting into Ethiopia as as the part of the the South Semitic that mixes with Amharic, uh, or that you get the Amharic right. um, and and Gies and other. Um. So, I'm not sure where I am at the moment, but we, we giants, basal Eurasians. Ah, okay. So let me let me bring this to the Quran because okay. and, 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 and because so I've been doing all this work in in Oman and the Omanis came to me and they said, "Look, you you seem to be somebody who is willing to to 
roll up their sleeves and, 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 and actually go into oral tradition and mythology and religion and, and stories and, and, you know, sully yourself with, with these topics, which mm-hmm. scientists tend to run in fear of. Um, would you be willing to, to uh, apply that to one of our biggest myths in the Quran, which is the, the lost people of Ad? And, and I, I knew of it only because it, it, it's a joke. I knew of it because when I started working in Oman in 2002, and you know, with all of these preconceived notions that were all wrong, um, and, and they're coming up to me, and, and they've all got on their phones and showing me these horribly Photoshopped pictures of archaeologists working in the desert, excavating these enormous 10-foot-tall giant skeletons. And, you know, this is happening constantly. It was like, oh, did you find any of the people of Odd yet? I was like, yeah, yeah, I don't know about this, this Odd business. Yeah. And, and, and then there's, this, there's, a, you know, there's a lost city that gets thrown into the desert called, called Iram um, of, of the Lofty Pillars, or Ubar, it's also known as, uh, which is part of this myth. The, they call it the Atlantis of the Sands. Um, and then there's um, uh, the land of Allah Kaf which is the land that they were supposed to live. So this was, this was kind of my starting point was they said, look, we know that uh, Akhkaf is Southern Arabia. Um, were there ever people of Ad? And, 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 and what's the story all about? And, and, and this, this is what sent me off on this latest four year um, journey, which, which is, which is it was a very spiritual journey and um, it was very unexpected. In, in that I never took the Quran very seriously. I never took what I was doing. Um, I was interested in explaining things. I wasn't interested in, in, in my own personal growth or finding any, any meaning for my, my, my side. I didn't think that, that these would have a practical application for today, for modern times. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and I started with the Quran. And first of all, um, it, it's... I, I, in my, the little bit of Arabic that I can speak, and you know, cutting and pasting into Google or into Google Translate, because I'm big. I'm big into get to the original word. Don't trust right. the translated word. Tra- translated words get us into trouble all the time. And, and I thought, all right, well, I'll take the job. I'll try this. I'll try it because the, 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 I knew that the land of Allah Kaf in the story it's dramatically turned to desert. So I thought, all right, this is a pretty good starting point. We, we, we know that Arabia was dramatically, was, was green. It was dramatically turned to desert. So we already know, I can already feel out a kernel of truth in the story. And let's see what else is true. So I you know, got into, into, onto the computer and did a quick search on the Quran, some Quran website. You know, give me every, every instance in the Quran where the people of Ad are mentioned uh, or the land of Allah Kaf is mentioned. Mm-hmm. The land of Alakaf is where they lived, and the, and the name of the tribe or the king or the people, whatever you want to call it, is Ad. And it's, it's, that, it's that fun letter to say as well, Ad, where you really have to, it really just kind of comes out of your throat. <laughs> um, but these are the first people of Arabia. These are the, and, um, we know that they are giants. It says that, that God increased them in stature. It doesn't mm-hmm. say they were giants. In, again, go back to the original language, increased in stature. All right, so they were tall. Doesn't mean they were abnormally or supernaturally tall. It just means they were tall. Um, it talks about how they were mighty. They were tyrants. They were territorial. And, um, and I, at this point, I was actually trying to disprove the myth because I was, because I was trying to disprove this lost city. And, 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 and I, was, you know, I was trying to say, look, the people of Southern Arabia, they never made cities out of stone. They didn't. It's ludicrous to have this city. Why are people looking for a lost city in the middle of the desert? This is, this is, this is ridiculous. They built out of wood. Um, they were, you know, we know that they were master woodworkers. And, and my friend, who is an Islamic scholar, you know, very open-minded, and, and we love sort of comparing notes on the, the, the biblical tradition versus the, the, the Quranic tradition. Um, so this is our past. This is what we do for fun. So doing this and I like um, me and my mates over here as well. <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> yeah, I guess yeah. there's you know, birds of a feather. Um, and and so we're we're doing this, and he says, well, actually, um, there is no mention of an incense trade, which is what people thought that this had something to do with frankincense. Fra- this is also, by the way, the, the Dofar where I work. 
is the one place in the world where frankincense grows naturally. So this is where. Oh, OK. There, there, there's a great kids book called um, something Jamal and the and, and, and the and the wise men. And it's about it's a camel's perspective on the nativity as, as the camel comes up, bringing the, the incense with the wise men up for um, right. to, to witness the birth of Jesus. But anyway, right. so <clears throat> so we were talking about. Um, you know, this, this mistranslation of this tradition. And he says, well, actually, uh, for instance, the word, the word pillar, you know, we thought there was supposed to be this pillared city of, of gardens and springs and pools in the desert. Well, actually, that could also mean tent pole. So as soon as he said that, my ears sort of perked up, went, okay, wait a minute. This, this might actually apply to the Neolithic. And then he said, and then, um, and I, I had, like I said, I had gone through all of these different quotes and I, and I pull out this one quote and I said, well, the one thing that, that the one term that's used to describe these people, aside from them being giants and listing off all of their sins, is that um, they were blessed with cattle and children. And, and this was just after I had finished a, a, a publishing a, a study of the genetics of the Dofari people, where we had found out that they were the ones who seemed to have domesticated cattle because they had the, the, the highest incidence of lactase persistence. So, so, we'd already, so naturally, I'd already come on this part of the story through the archaeology and through the genetics that there's some people, mystery people in South Arabia who were really <clears throat> tall, who were living off of cattle, who seemed to have, uh, genetically, they seemed to have domesticated cattle. They, they, they were the ones who introduced this mutation into our gene pool. Um, and then there are all these other lines in the story. It says they're tyrants, they're warlike. And we know, uh, for instance, there's a graveyard in the Emirates from this time period, mm -hmm. the late Neolithic, where 11% of the specimens, I think they found 350 or so uh, bones, uh, individuals, 11% were killed by trauma. Um, then you superimpose this whole other aspect of the story which is they were wiped, it says they were working in their fields during the days of misfortune, uh, which to me... This, this is they, in the Quran, I mentioned. This is in, this is in the Quran. It's all okay. over the Quran. This is one of the most prominent stories in the Quran. And but during I'm, the days... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to definitely, because I also uh, have a fascination with Islamic history and the Quran. Um, and I'm going to be looking into the you know, where it appears in the Quran, because as far as I understand with the Quran, it's actually a mishmash. So if a friend of mine, when we have our discussions, he actually put it best. He said, take pretty much all Christian material in the first century, take all the Gnostic literature that came afterwards, take all the church fathers and then the Nestorian Gnosticism that went into pre-Islamic Arabia. Because don't forget, you also have a pagan culture in pre-Islamic Arabia. And literally take scissors, cut it all up, <laughs> and then truncate it down, and then you have the Quran. Um, so he, okay, now yeah. he, here here's my um, here's what I've had to come to terms with. So let let, let me make a long story short. Yeah. In, in that the people of Ad were wiped out by a dust bowl. They overgrazed. They, they did never switch to farming. They never switched to goats. They were just stuck on these damn cows. And, and cows, as, as we know today, um, are, 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 you know, have a major impact on the ecosystem. And so, so between the period between 6,000 and 4,000 BC mm -hmm. was the period when the monsoon retreated away from the Arabian Peninsula. So these are the, what I would call the days of misfortune that appear in, 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 in the story. Mm -hmm. And you have hundred year droughts during this time period and, and, and million square kilometers of grassland dying off. And one of the key aspects of the description of the sins of the people of Odd is that it's, they're intransigent. They, they do not adapt to, they, it says they keep practicing the traditions of their ancestors. Uh, we find sites where they'll slaughter 60 cattle overnight, all in one go, um, just for ritual purposes. Which is not something you want to do yeah, yeah. When, when you're when you're staring famine. You know, you, you don't just slaughter sixty cows to, to hope it, it improves the the situation. Mm -hmm. um, and they went extinct. And 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 we do. I mean, there's bits of their DNA still in in the gene pool, 
But their language, which I was arguing earlier, is this tonal language related to Sumerian, is a buzzing language because it's, you know, they're the Zamzamim, uh, the, the, the related to the Nephilim, I, I suppose, in, in some way, the, the, ancient, the ancient powerful forefathers of, of ancient times. Right. Um, which, you know, it fits. Hunter gatherers and pastoralists, um, they're bigger than farmers. So they are more powerful. They are more uh, outdoorsy. They're wild. They're untamed uh, versus the, the, the Fertile Crescent city folk and in the, in the urban civilizations that had made that, that transition fully into, into agricultural societies and eventually into, into um, civilization with a capital C. Uh, but the other point, um, just uh, we were talking about, um, I was going to offer a counterpoint to mm -hmm. what you were saying about um, um, uh, b -b 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 ah, what the Quran is. Mm -hmm. And so at a certain point, and this was recently, a few months ago, when I got to the end of my book and was having to deal with the fact that the Quran may actually um, reference Gobekli Tepe. Well, how is that possible that, 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 that Muhammad could have any knowledge of Gobekli Tepe? But there's a line in the Quran. Uh, it's, it's completely mistranslated. So I'm the only, only one, I think, who, who would offer this translation. <laughs> but it, 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 in the, it's uh, in the dawn, chapter 89, okay. uh, verse, verse, uh, verses 7 through 12, I think they are. Um, it's, it's, it's this poem which, which, which boils down the Quran and it boils down to all of ancient wisdom as far as I'm concerned. So it's a, it a great point for us to get to. Mm -hmm. And it starts off, and it's poem in Arabic. I can't, it says, have you heard about the people of Ad? Of Iram, Dati Alimad, which means of, of, of Iram, which is a place name. Um, Dati means possessing. Alimad means, um, um, well, this is a, you know, we lost the word. We don't know what the word means. It could mean tent pole it can mean lofty pillar it's usually translated as lofty pillar decorated pillar um the likes of which the world had never seen before in in balad so it's ad amad balad and it says have you heard about the the, the people of thamud who who carve their homes from the rocks in the valleys alad um well that's the that's the Nabataeans. That's the you know, who else in the Arabian Peninsula carved gorgeous, beautiful homes in, into the rock faces. The, mm -hmm. the Quran calls them Thamud, um, and the Quran also in a later verse talks about the Nabataeans being destroyed by shock, uh, the Thamud. Sorry, uh, being destroyed by shock waves, and we know for a fact that Petra was leveled twice from earthquakes. So um, this is an easy one. And then it says, have you heard about the Pharaoh, the Lord of the, it's kind of a funny word, Al-Qad, uh, the Lord of the serpent, or the Lord of the stake, or the Lord of the sorcerer, mm -hmm. of the sorcerers. That's, that's um, Ayat 10. So I'm looking at the Quran right now. Okay. Yes. And then, and then um, I think something, and all of these people in all of their lands, they made facade. And facade means they corrupted their lands. They destroyed their ecosystems. And, and when you get into the story of the odd, it's a story, the, the prophet, because it's, it's just like Sodom and Gomorrah. So it follows the same pattern of um, a warning being sent via a messenger. In this case, the messenger's name is Hood. And Hood comes down and, he, and he's, he says to them, look, guys, you've got to stop. You know, what are you doing? You're building monuments on every high place. You're building towers. You're building, you know, for what? For your own pride, just to amuse yourselves? Um, and, and, and he goes on and on, and, and it's the civilization that's practicing excess, as we talked about. They're, they're, they're building these monuments for no reason. They're, 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 you know, how great we are. Oh, we're wonderful. We can do these great things for no reason. Um, and, and they're overgrazing their land. And what happens one day is they look up from their valleys, and there's this black cloud coming at them. And they get swallowed up by the, the, the odd, the people of odd I'm talking about. They get swallowed up when it says the Quran is this incredible, this vivid um, description. Uh, the barren wind. And when it arrived, um, nothing but death and punishment. And then it goes on and on and talks about how the winds you know, lasted for seven days. And 
plucked up their houses and plucked up, the, just wiped out the entire civilization and it turned the land into Allah Kaf, which literally just means the crescent shaped dune. So, um, so, so this is the, 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 the what? dune, sand dune. Yeah. Okay. So, it, so it, it's the land of dunes, the land of Allah Kaf, the land of the dunes. Um, and this is how it became the land of the dunes. So, what I take out of this is two things. Well, first of all, you have this intransigence. You have this refusal to accept the fact that the climate is changing. And they're living off of a, a, an ungulate that eats massive amounts of grass. The other thing that this does, and this is what they're doing today, is they're overgrazing the land and they're, and they're removing the grass cover. And the American Southwest between 1932 and 1938 is the perfect uh, metaphor or analogy for what happened to the people of Ad. Um, you know, American cowboys get into, into the Southwestern territories and immediately, you know, they introduce cows into the region. They introduce deep plow farming to, to, to cultivate corn. And as a result, they remove the grass cover that's holding the sediment in place. And then they have a drought. And then before you know it, they're getting these dust storms called black blizzards that, that 20, I think 25,000 people are killed from dust asphyxiation. A quarter million people wow. are uprooted okay. within a period of six years. Um, if you go through the, 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 photo, the, the newspaper photographs of the Dust Bowl yeah. and you read what happened to the people of Odd, it's, it's like you don't have to look any. It, it, for me, I've never had such an easy you know, case closed explanation of anything. Um, and, and, you know, in this case, and, 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 and um, so just, just to summarize, so you, you think, um, Surah 89 is a recounting of, of, of a very ancient thing that happened in art. Well, uh, in, in this case, Surah 89 and most, most of the Quran. So, so what I was going to say to you earlier is, is, is all of these, um, uh, revelations to use that, I mean, to use that word in the literal sense, um, for me of, of the Gulf, uh, of Eden, of, you know, whatever you want to call it, whatever you want to use, you know, the words you want to use to describe these places and these events, they adhere to the oral traditions that appear in Genesis. Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and shockingly accurately as they do in the Quran. So that sent me off to Australia appropriately enough um, <laughs> okay. to, to researching the durability of myth, because then, then, then it was sort of the question of, all right, how is it possible? So, so I, I, I can't accept um, all of this coming down as, as a single package of inspiration to Moses um, mm. on top of a mountain. Mm -hmm. I need an explanation. I need a scientific explanation. Mm -hmm. And in Australia, gives us that explanation. So when, you, when we study Aboriginal culture, Aboriginal culture is fantastic because it's almost a laboratory, pristine um, civilization, society that never developed a writing system mm -hmm. and kept passing down stories. You have God knows how many different subgroups, language subgroups, tribal subgroups that have nothing to do with each other over vast distances. Um, so each one is its own laboratory experiment. And so there have been lots of studies done in the past decade on, on abor Aboriginal traditions, Aboriginal storytelling, looking at how durable are myths and what, what they found. In some cases, there's stories about, um, was it a wandering sun god that, 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 that came to earth and, and Established violently establishes home in this impact crater. Uh, I'm butchering this, the, the, the story, but, but anyway, the point is, is there's an Aboriginal story about a 4,700 year old um, impact crater. And yeah. they, they, the, 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 the language, the words they use suggests that they knew that this was an impact and they'd seen impact crater, you know, they'd seen this kind of, they'd seen it happen. Um, but then the obvious, the other obvious study is looking at tribes living along the coast and they all individually have their own version of a sea level come not a flood story i don't like using the word flood story because it has nothing to do with the biblical flood story but they have their own right. they all have their own versions of of what happened when the coastal plain was swallowed up 
7,000 years ago by, by sea level rise, by, by when the last 10, 15 meters of shelf was swallowed up. And every one of these groups had a story uh, of this event that was not introduced to them at a later date that, that indicates the, door, the durability of, of myth can last for at least 7,000 years. Wow. The, problem, wow. the problem then is when we write it down because we, when we write it down, it becomes figuratively, literally set in stone and, and language is an evolving thing. You know, the language we're right. using to speak is different than the English that was used by Chaucer. And, it, you know, and I, you know, I defy anyone to go back and read Chaucer and make any sense of that in, right. in its original English. And, in the, and that's only a thousand years. So apply that same logic to writing systems, or, you know, early writing systems. And, and as soon as they make it down onto text, you know, by the time we get into Genesis, how the heck did, did Noah end up at Mount Ararat? You know, he's supposed to be on Mount Dilmun. It, that, that's the original account. Uh, oh, you mean Mount Tana, from... right? Is that what you mean? No, no, I mean in the, in the, in the flood story. Oh, you mean uh, Noah? Not yeah, yeah. It, yeah, yeah. It, 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 yeah, yeah. How did heck, how the heck did Noah come resting on Mount Ararat? You know that is such but a then, perversion just, of the original. Yeah, sorry. Just just quickly, because again, in my flood research, apparently it's it's um, the English translation is Ararat, but it should be Uratu. Uh, okay. And then and Uratu, and in fact, Mount Judy. Is specifically is the mountain that even Islamic literature, literature agrees with. And by the way, early church fathers, um, uh, especially um, Syrian uh, church fathers, uh, said it was Mount Judy, which is much lower down in the Armenian range, close to the or, or, or you've got, or in, in, in the, you know, when you look at the Eridu Genesis, which is the, you know, version that was put onto a clay tablet 2100 BC, and, and mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're saying the mountains of Dilmun. So, so right here, this conversation we're having is beautifully illustrates the point about language and about language becomes inflexible while oral tradition remains um, fluid enough that the meaning can be passed on along with the ideas. So this was the, this was the, for this to happen, the researchers have found there, there, there need to be three conditions in place for this to happen. Um, and this is why Australia is, is, is you know, the go-to laboratory place to study oral tradition, because you need to have an isolated population that has not been, you know, undergone any major demographic changes. And obviously uh, Aborigines come uh, 40,000 or even before. Now I, I read a study so maybe 60,000. Something yeah, like 60, our... 40, and, yeah. And, 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 and their stories certainly are, you know, multiple thousands of years old, mm -hmm. five, six, seven thousand years old. And um, I would put the flood, so, so basically, I, I, there's, a, there's a 2015 paper that uses your work. It's actually written by a, 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 a geophysicist who is also in Iraq. I think it's called the Iraq Geophysical Journal or something like that. And he, basically, there's a, um, you know, the, the Gulf of um, Oman? Uh, mm -hmm. there's, like, there's like a dam, like a natural dam that gave way, and he's dating it to 13,000 to 8,000 years ago, mm -hmm. where the ocean just came in and, f and just then made the Persian Gulf to be the way it is today. Mm -hmm. And it lasted for about a year. Like it was just this tsunami that just came in. And that's the flood model that I'm proposing that happened well after the Aborigines come into Australia. Yeah, um, yeah. so, so let, 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 let me clarify here because I'm yeah, not, yeah, yeah. Bringing, but, I'm not yeah. bringing the Aboriginal flood up as anything related necessarily to the biblical flood, or that, but simply to illustrate how old myths can be. How in, on, on how how old exactly before you know being passed on to you know so, so I'm basically I'm suddenly saying I, agree. I, I agree with so, you that the Aborigines didn't have a Noah's flood idea yeah. because they went around anyway yeah but but yeah. but you've got but what they give us is is an indication of what do you need for 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 stories to survive mm -hmm. what exactly do you need so so one is you need this population to be uh, continuous 
with the landscape. That's but so, so first you can't have any any massive influx of population. You can, nobody new can come in with their own ideas, their own um, you know, and, and defeat you, and then and then superimpose their stories on top of yours. Then you're going to lose them. The, the second thing you can't have is um, displacement from that landscape. So, and this is why um, I think you know here anyone who's looked at, at Mesopotamian literature, clearly the flood is, is a Mesopotamian phenomenon. I, mm -hmm. I could never get my head around the whole Black Sea explanation simply because nobody around the Black Sea ever told a flood story. I agree. Um, yeah. I don't hold to that hypothesis. Yeah. And, and then the third, and I think this is the key, the third aspect is that culture's emphasis on storytelling. And, and transmit and cultural transmission. And so for the Australian Aboriginal, the idea of dream time and yeah. storytelling, performance art, yeah. um, this is what makes, this is what, what allow, this is why not everybody, every culture in the world has the stories that we do. Or it has these durable stories. But one thing is for sure, these people in the Middle East, they are obsessed with genealogies with mm -hmm. tracking their history, with archiving them. And, and the evidence, the best evidence I can give you for this is the fact that I don't speak, a, I speak some Hebrew, I don't speak a word of, of ancient Hebrew, and I can still sit here for, for probably a minute and, and, and recite my, my Torah portion from mm -hmm. 31 years ago when I had a bar mitzvah, because mm -hmm. it's sung, it's recited. When you're actually you know, reading the, the Torah, you have cantillation marks, or, or, or what are called in the Quran, they're called tajweed. Mm -hmm. So in both cases, these are orally performed traditions that are not meant, you're not meant to just you know, pick up a book and read it to yourself. You're meant to perform it. Mm. And, 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 and that tells you, so this brings a long way around to the story of what is the Quran, what is the Bible, uh, what, let me rephrase that, what is the Torah? Um, this is simply the, the writing down of oral traditions that have been banging around a, a highly nomadic territory for mm -hmm. thousands and in some cases tens, uh, well, no, I wouldn't say tens, but in some cases up to nine, 10,000 years ago. Yeah. So if we start with the Garden of Eden, um, you know, like, you know, that describes to a T the Holocene climatic optimum the period mm -hmm. between 9,200 and 7,800 years ago in the Arabian Peninsula. Sea levels are still down. The Gulf is still exposed. The monsoon is pushing north. Everything is just right um, for a very, you know, for about a 2,000-year period, for a 2,000-year window. Before what, what time frame would you place this in? How many years ago? Um, so the Holocene climatic optimum. This is, this yeah. is when I, I keep talking about the monsoon. Yeah, and if you and if you think of the monsoon belt is is, is a belt that runs around the entire world, um, or the entire Indian Ocean latitudes, and it bounces up and down north and south over the course of the ice ages, depending on global temperatures, depending on global meteorological patterns. Mm -hmm. So during the the last ice age, it gets pushed south away from the Arabian Peninsula into the Indian Ocean. It's not hitting any of Arabia, and then after the last ice age starting, say, around 13, 12, 11,000 years ago, it starts to come north. And by uh, 9, 8,000 years ago, it's dumping over the deserts. And, the, and this is right. when we suddenly see the, my basal Eurasians, you know, the, the people right. of Ad. This is when the cattle herders uh, fill the, Arabian, the, the interior of the Arabian Peninsula. I mean, it just it is full of archaeology, and this is the point I've failed to make in my publications, is just how dense the material is from this time period, um, the climatic optimum. Mm -hmm. and, and then you have the pullback to the monsoon, so then it retreats back to the south and then triggers this whole series of droughts um, and, and um, challenge, it, it wipes out the cattle herders for the most part. Um, they get very territorial, they start beating the crap out of each other from, from you know, one, one territory to the next. I mentioned the graveyard where we found 11% uh, people who had died of, of blunt force trauma. Um, and and just quickly, it's, again, it's kind of Genesis scriptures 
going through my mind when, he, when he's saying this because I'm thinking of where God, so after Noah comes out of the ark and he's like, oh, now we can eat meat. And then <laughs> in the same, in the same uh, verse, it says, and if you kill anyone, don't forget that you're going to be murdering it, the Amago Day, like the people made in my image, which again yeah. is curious, the fact that he has to even mention that, and now you're talking about blunt trauma and the, and, then, and he's entering a territory, a very violent yeah. territory that had been very violent. And these people, yeah. I mean, I think if we're so for me, I when I when I originally published that flood story, I or uh, the, the Gulf paper, I was thinking about the flood as, as an earlier event. I really didn't want to, you know, just I didn't want it to be a sensational catastrophe, catastrophism explanation. I was I was again, running away from the Bible, trying mm. to make it as um, scientific as possible. Except I got to a certain point um, after publishing that paper where, where I'm, I'm, I'm reading all the different accounts and they're just saying the same thing over and over and over again, which is the sky is blackened um, you know, and, 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 and released you know, all the waters of heaven onto the earth. And, and the... <laughs> Um, the, 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 the springs from the deep are exploding out and the rivers are flooding and the winds are screaming and braying like donkeys. And this is just a wonderful, vivid imagery. And then having lived in Oman for seven years, uh, we, we were starting to get hit by cyclones. And, um, and I remember, well, first of all, there was one in 2007 that caused billions of dollars worth of damage. It just smacked into Moscow, into the capital, straight, straight on. Um, and just wiped, you know, wiped out whole neighborhoods. Wow. It looked like uh, I was there a few months afterward. It looked like the giants had just come and lifted up the street and thrown it down again and torn it apart. <laughs> and I mean, it, it was yeah, it was. It That's was, horrible. Uh, yeah, it, it really um, goes to show the power of nature in, in mm. this in the desert. I mean, that's part yeah. of all all of what we're talking about in this discussion is. A location then, that has profound climate change, right? And that, and then that's deeply rooted in the psyche of the oral tradition, yeah. More so than yeah. the written account, so to speak. The written account is just, I guess, you could say, finally said and yeah, so, truncated form out of that oral tradition, which is much more richer and and more elaborate yeah. than the, the written. So, so I, I mean, this is. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so we had one final cyclone in 2013, where for a few days they were predicting the path, and we were watching: is it going to hit us in Muscat? Or, and it was showing it was going to thread the needle through Hormuz and end up in the Gulf. And then, and then suddenly, I just sort of had this part of my language: "Holy shit!" moment of a cyclone <laughs> in the Gulf. Wait a minute. How, how could I miss this? You know, and, and then I did a little bit of Googling and I found some research on what are called gray swan natural disasters. Gray swan events, which are rare events um, that cause unimaginable damage for what, perfect storms, essentially. And in the Indian Ocean, the perfect storm is, is, a, is a cyclone in the Gulf. And, and, and they're now predicting in the 21st century that... that the odds have gone, gone up to one in every 700 years this might happen um, because of the heating up of the Indian Ocean. But you can get a cyclone into the Gulf, and as, and as soon as it, it's in this enclosed basin and it's being fed by superheated surface temperatures of the water, you get gusts of wind up to 400 kilometers an hour. Whoa. And I think, I think the highest on record is 315, which hit um, the Philippines a couple of years ago. And, and now they're, they're saying that, you know, in these models that you could have 400 kilometers an hour. Now, wow. this coincides nicely with, with a real period of climatic instability around 4000 BC, um, which also happens to be 4200, 4100, which also happens to be the very end of the Ubaid civilization, who are these, the, I talked about them earlier, they're these incredibly advanced people living around the Gulf, trading up and down the Gulf. And they've got bitumen rafts and domesticated cattle and domesticated dates, um, wheat, rye, uh, you know, just a, a really an affluent trading society. Mm. By 4000 BC, every single Ubaid site is abandoned, gone. 
Uh, and, and nobody has ever looked for flood damage. I don't know if anybody has ever explored the topic or even asked the question mm. of what, what ended the Ubaid civilization. But the whole thing unravels and it becomes reconstituted 3800 BC in, in, um, in Uruk. And this is then the Uruk expansion and the beginning of Samaria as we know it, beginning mm. of writing systems, beginning of... So there we have that story on the king's list. After right, the flood, right. the king's list came down. The kings came down again, and the kingship was in Kish, and then the kingship was in... Yeah. And in, I mean, in fact, you, you, I would divide the king's list into three sections. You have the prehistoric section, which refers to the, all of the Ubaid rulers, which is, your, which is our you know, Genesis 1, um, chapters 1 through 7. You know, this is Adam to um, Noah. Then mm -hmm. you have your proto-historic part of the king's list which is sort of semi-fantasy semi-reality which talks about the rebuilding of their civilization between 3800 and say 2800 and then you get the proper king's list which is all the kings that we actually know we can historically show yeah. our real ruler from 28 2700 so there's prehistory proto-history and regular history on the king's list um, and i think that that if you if you look at it that way it, it, it situates the flood at 4,000 BC, which coincides with the high sea levels. Uh, with a, with a, so not only did the, the Gulf reach its current level, but then it exceeded those current levels by about five meters, three to five meters, for several thousand years. And those waters didn't die down again until, um, until the Middle Bronze Age, uh, until Dilmun, you know, the, 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 the time of Dilmun that, that we know about from, from myth. From myth. Um, so it's... Uh, so this is just to clarify. This is a Persian Gulf flooding, four thousand BC, or where would you where would you geographically locate this? Specific so, 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 so ge geographically, the Ubaid the Ubaid civilization are located in southern Mes southern Mesopotamia, uh, the land that eventually becomes known as Samaria, okay, and all the way down to the United Arab Emirates, all the way on the southern and western side of the Gulf, all along the shores. Okay. Okay. And, and what they're doing is they're, they're, they're um, diving for pearls down in the south and because you get freshwater oysters. Right? So, again, it all comes back to freshwater in the months. Oh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. all this yeah. all this freshwater coming up from the bottom of the Gulf feeds these amazing pearls. And you get all this gorgeous, um, you know, pearling industry uh, firing on all cylinders throughout the Neolithic. And they're trading up, in, up to Mesopotamia and they're getting in exchange pottery. Uh, wheat, um, food, perishable supplies, mm. and and the, and then and domesticated cattle, uh, presumably as well. Mm. So so all of this is happening, and then it just comes to an abrupt end. And and in the oldest story, after you know you have the the um, Enki, the god of fresh water, uh, telling. Uh, Ziasudra, who is Noah, mm -hmm. telling him, "Okay, you got to build the boat. You've got, you know, we, we've, we've decided to kill everyone, but but I'm going to save you, and you need to build the boat. Do it this way." And at the end of the story, he ends up in the mountains of Dilmun, which is you know, there are no mountains of Dilmun other than the the, the, the mountains of, of Oman and the UAE in in eastern Arabia. So, so that, that would be where the Armenian mountain range. Roughly so this right. would be what's what's where the what's called the Hajar Mountains. So okay. if, if essentially if you if if you follow the map, I wish I could show you this map right here. <laughs> if you follow the 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 Strait of Hormuz down, there's okay. a mount, there's a mountain range that runs along that entire side of the Arabian Peninsula, and that's Dilmun is Eastern Arabia. So the mountains of Dilmun would be the Hajar Mountains, which is now Oman and UAE. Um. Yes, I'm just looking. I'm just looking at. Yeah, because that, you see, that's very close to um, that Mount Judy thing I mentioned. Um, so it's roughly in the same region, I think, that you're talking about. So, so I think that. So, so to come to come back to, I think the broader point, because this is what makes all of this so fascinating for me, is what? He, how are these stories? so accurate actually and, and this is somebody who is not looking for any truth in these stories but how have they how do they so accurately in, in some cases um 
reflect these these ancient events from seven thousand or eight thousand years ago. Yeah. And and in 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 looking at the Bible and coming to see how um, the kingdom of kingdoms of Judah and the kingdom of Israel of Israel formed, and who were the people telling you know who are the scribes who are the educated people writing these stories down who are the, who are our our narrators um, as it were of genesis and of, of exodus and and you know, i actually would would argue keeping in mind i'm jewish here so but i would argue that that the quran has more accuracy than the bible in some cases for two reasons first of all you have geographic continuity so by, by, the, by the nature of the, of the narrative itself, by the end of Genesis, the, the, the main characters that we're following, uh, mm -hmm. the family of, of Joseph, they've, they've now been displaced from their land. And, and by that logic, if we were to take that at face value, then that displacement means they no longer, we can no longer trust their place names from the Arabian Peninsula from that point onward. Um, the, 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 the second thing I would, I would argue is that by um, writing it down so early, it's had more time to pass through language and, languages and alphabets and confusion, while the Quran, it's, it's such a different text. And I was, I was so surprised structurally when I read the Quran because I was expecting, you know, the Bible is linear. Mm. This, 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 and this. And then, yeah, you have a retelling every once in a while. But for the most part, it's, it's a seamless, linear um, progression. Mm -hmm. The Quran is just repeating stories over and over and over again in different ways and in different contexts. And yeah. so, I, I, uh, so my, my, my theory is actually that, you know, in both cases, they're drawing on, for the source material of Genesis, for sure, um, in parts of Exodus, they're drawing upon the oral traditions of the people of the Arabian Peninsula. And mm. in, in, in the case of the Quran, you know, it took 23 years for this guy to actually get it onto paper. And, and he's going around with different scribes. They're writing it down for him. And I'm talking about Muhammad. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, and, and so in my mind, and I hope this isn't disrespectful because I, I, I think it's an amazing text, but I think what he's doing is, is collecting the different perspectives of all the different tribes all across the Arabian Peninsula. I mean, that was what made the Quran so powerful a document, was that it, it enabled this confederacy. And, and, and I think you can also apply that to, to uh, the Torah, just to some extent, um, mm -hmm. that it enabled this confederacy um, to come out. In both cases, it's coming out of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, when you look at the genetic, and this is the, genetically speaking, certainly the Kohanim are are not Levantine people, um, the, the Levites. They're not, these are not Levantine genetic markers. These are Arabian genetic markers. Okay. Uh, you know, and this is the, this is the truth that this is the hard part of, of my research is that it, 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 it does get into political territory because, mm -hmm. because of the inaccuracies, the fact that, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm putting a target on me now. I'm saying I would, I would, I would argue Abraham may never have set foot in the Negev desert or near Beersheba. Um, Abraham okay. and his whole lineage, the, the, the uh, uh, table of nations, chapter 10, verse 21 through 30. Where did the descendants of, of Shem end up? They ended up in the lands between Mesca and Zafar. Mm. Uh, in the, you know, the right. hill country of Dofar. So it's talking about the people from Mecca to Dofar um, in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, so I think that there is, there's a lot that we have to dance around because of modern politics, which gets in the way of getting to the truth of what really happened um, in the Arabian Peninsula between 10,000 years ago and um, right. 1,000 years ago, which is the cause of so much conflict. For no reason, because we're all telling the same story. <laughs> I will. I will quickly say this. Um, there are some. Again, not to be disrespectful, if there's any Muslim in the audience, but there are some goofy moments in the Quran, which is like in the same stream of what you're talking about. For example, or of the Chaldeans uh, that yeah. you, you know in Genesis, Abraham comes from, and that's another thing. There's two different auras. There's Urar or Or. 
So there's yeah. a sound yeah. aura. Well, then, I, I could, well, when I was, I was in Gobekli Tepe, and everyone's going, yeah. oh, yeah, this is where Abraham's from. I'm going, that's what they told me. This. <laughs> I got the same story when I was in Ur. You guys need to get your story straight. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, that, and, 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 and this is why I think oh, I just, I was just they, they, say... they work together in stereo. Yeah, right. I was just going to say that, uh, unfortunately, in the second century AD, so we're talking Abraham from a, from an Ugaritic sort of context, Ugaritic the, the language from Ugarit, um, or just means city, or yeah. like even in the New Testament, uh, when Stephen in Acts seven, he he says country, yeah. um, but this Jerome. Is the... Well, this this goes back to your linguistics. Your, it's all linguistics. linguistics. Yeah, yeah. That 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 causes problems. So so Jerome, the church, the guy who made the Latin, the the Vulgate, when he translated the, the Bible into into the Vulgate, he translated "or" as fire, because the he the Hebrew word "or" means yeah, light. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Or, and then that led into a whole uh, myth of Abraham from the fire of the Chaldeans. And so then you have Nestorian Gnostics deriving from a Catholic sort of context because the Vulgate was used in, in the Catholic, early Roman Catholic Church. And then by the time Muhammad's on the scene, this story of Abraham from the fire of the Chaldeans was already there as this legend. And then you have it in the Quran mentioned like eight different times that, that Allah saved Abraham from the fire of the Chaldeans. Yep. And my argument is Allah goofed up because he didn't know, that means he didn't know the difference between Hebrew and Ugaritic. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. or, or, or certainly somebody who's, who's telling you, hey, no, this is exactly yeah. the problem is, is that we, we begin to get our, our lines tangled up in, in language and in, um, in, in, in conveying these. But what the Quran has, which, which, was, which, which blew me away, is the way I read the Quran is, is, is if, you, if you were to take every instance of the word Allah and replace it with Mother Nature, it is mind boggling. You keep using that word, but, but this one really is. Right. It, 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 because it, the meaning just, just, it just, everything makes sense. And it becomes a survival guide to climate change. And, and whereas oh, the Bible, okay. for, for me, when I read the Bible, I, I struggle to find any, um, except, you know, the, the New Testament. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I've, I've said this before in interviews, that the message of Jesus, you know, whether you're a religious person or not, is the single most important message of all of human history. And mm -hmm. until we pick up on that, which we haven't, you know, we've, we, we've run the other way, but until we actually clue into what, what he was trying to say, um, we will not cure any of our social problems, uh, mm -hmm. physical, environmental, any of that stuff. I mean, he, he, and in the same sense, the Quran, because it's being, it's, it's, it's a, a, a story or a compendium of stories written by people who are, who are sitting there in the Arabian Peninsula, watching the rise and the fall over and over again. And they're, they're watching the pharaohs build these pyramids and build these mighty, mighty pyramids, and then they disappear. And the pyramids are still there, so, mm. but the pharaohs are gone. Um, mm. And then you know, the same thing with, with the people of Ad, and talking about putting, building these monuments and high places and practicing you know, being excessive and sinful and... Um, and, and, and what they're simply trying to do is they're anthropologists simply trying to tell us how to get it right. Be nice to each other. Put your resources into one another, into sustainability, into creating, you know, into taking care of the earth because the earth is your temple. The earth is your God. Mm. Um, you know, and, and Jesus, he, he tried so hard. You know, he, he was beating people over the head saying this to them. Don't you know, look for me in the earth and the wind and the rocks and the, in the listen for me in the... Um, yeah, this is the yeah, gospel of Thomas. Ultimately, ulti yeah, ultimately, the, the two laws that that all the law and the prophets uh, align with, and that is love God and love your neighbor. And if those and, two things, 
psychologically you keep in mind, then you'll have a society that can do wonders. Um, and, 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 and if you, yes, and I think this is why you, you get these explosions every once in a while when, when, when religion, when, when they get it right for, for a period of time, as, as they did with Islam for three, four hundred years, when, um, you know, to understand Allah, to understand God, you have to question the universe. You have to question what you see and, and develop the scientific method out of, out of the Quran, out of that um, you know, telling them to be skeptical, to go question the earth, query the earth. And where, and, and you know, as long as, it, 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 if we're in a society where we can agree what these words mean, we can accomplish amazing things. But the second we start disagreeing with what these words mean, mm -hmm. um, we start you know, tearing each other's throats out. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that the... Um, um, I was going to say, the... Uh, um, nah, I lost that thought, so <laughs> it'll come back to me at some okay. point. Just, okay, this... this I can't thank you enough for this interview. It's it's so refreshing. Uh, it's been a gold mine of information. Um, My pleasure. Uh, what I can do, if you don't mind, I can spend ten minutes very briefly showing you what I piece together. And if you can, then spend like five or ten minutes on top of that, and then we can, if you want, you can end it because I know you're you might be feeling hungry. Yeah. No, nah, that's all right. I'm, I'm, I I sure? love this. I, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. This, okay. this is a once, a once in a while opportunity, and dinner is every night. Okay. So then, what? Okay, I think what I'll do then is, um, okay, just, just, okay. Lucas has been quiet. <laughs> okay, before I, before I get into what I'm going to do, Lucas. Yeah, wasn't I supposed to answer questions? I was. There yeah. supposed to be questions. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. So Lucas, go for it. Like. Say if you, if you have any questions, uh, or if, if you've been keeping up with the outside chat, the live feed. If, if any people have said anything, maybe you can bring that up, and then I'll go straight into this stuff that I put together. Okay. Oh, yeah. Think, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this, Jeffrey. I, I really, this is amazing. Uh, it, so, thank you again for coming on and being such a a wonderful guest. My pleasure. Uh, thank you, Rob, for hosting this. Uh, we're uh, I'm with my mother right now, and we're just we're just taking all this in. <laughs> but uh, most of the questions that I had were already answered, so I was just listening in, and you guys, between the two of you, you had already answered quite a few of the questions. Um, mostly about like. How do you feel about your work being used in here in America uh, through uh, different through organizations like Christian organizations? I think it's wonderful. I mean, this is the first I'm hearing of it, so I didn't. I, I never really knew about it. Um, I think it's wonderful. I think that you know anything that furthers the the, the, the ball of truth. You know, we kick kick the ball of truth down the line a little bit and gets people thinking about it. And I and I, I think that we. We went too far in, in the sterile direction of science and ended up throwing out religion and our, and our oldest stories and all the wisdom that went with it. And, and, and I think we're paying the price for that to some extent and, and need to make peace with, with uh, religious belief in the world. And, and, um, and I, and I think this, you know, biblical understanding the Bible is something that that's essential. I I would argue for for atheists, for you know, fundamentalists, for everyone in between, because these are ten thousand year old stories. This is what we've carried as a species from the beginning, and it's the knowledge that we have accumulated. And uh, you know, we um, we were just talking about how, you know, in some senses, the Quran and the Bible as well, these are guides to living together in peace and harmony with one another and with the earth. And yet, here we are today, you know, absolutely drowning in, a, in, in our own, you know, and I'm guilty, as everyone is, in our own greed, sloth, and, you know, we, we're condemning every one of the sins, and, and we're, we're separated from nature, and, you know, like I said, if you, if you replace the word God 
with the replace the word with, with the word nature. You, you, I, I feel like people would just yeah, they tune out when they hear God because they don't know what that means or they or they have a preconceived notion that that's a dude sitting on a cloud with a big beard. And it, it, nature is is a sort of modern term that doesn't have that baggage. Um, and, and then it's up to people to to determine what what what's behind that nature. But I think that if you if you just think of religion as a way of existing with nature, how do we how do we do our job? What is our job on this earth? What are we here for? How do we do our job? How do what what is the right thing to do? How do we know? right from wrong and and i think that we, we we got lost as a species along the way which has gotten us to this point and so i love that that if this research shakes anything loose and if we can move on to the next stage of developing ourselves as spiritual species and as a as a um just a nicer species than we've been up until now. I said early, right, right at the beginning, and I never came back to this point, but I said what, what we learned from the earliest humans tells us a lot about who we are today. And the, the earliest humans, they kill. They're just killers. Their toolkit is all hunting equipment, killing equipment. Right. They are masters of taking down. These are, these are the you know, basal Eurasians that get into the Arabian Peninsula. And so we have to understand that about our nature is, is we we have to transcend that to some extent, this, this killing uh, mindset that we have and, the, and that we dominate nature instead of um, our children of nature. That's, that's actually what I wanted to say maybe like half an hour ago when you were talking about the Aborigines because um, I read a paper on why the Aborigines, like, and you mentioned it yourself, they just stayed stagnant from a technological context, even though the, 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 I'm, I'm we're talking Australia, like it, there's, there is no monolithic Aborigine. It's, yeah, it's, so, yeah. it's just a rich variety, right? But this paper basically argued that because of the abusement of the fauna of Australia, and obviously not having an agricultural and even a farm like so like like the cow for example like what we were talking about because they didn't have that uh and plus then again after the the ending of the last ice age now they're literally locked off they're now just stuck on this yeah. huge continent that therefore they just that's why they remain stagnant in that um, whereas the other humans they were utilizing uh but but here know, is with the cows Here and all. is the the question that um, that I would then pose: is we, 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 you know, stagnant is a loaded word. It, um, it kind of is, yeah. And, yeah. But but I think but I'm glad you used it because I think it's very telling about how we as as as, as a society tend to look at traditional societies. Go, well, they never, you know, they don't have. Mm. Toilets, plumbing, they, they, they have this, 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 and this. They have all of these problems. Um, and the truth is, is that uh, we're not doing very well compared to them. So, so, so while we have increased our population numbers, uh, we've reduced infant mortality rates, we can combat certain diseases, we've introduced a whole new set of problems and diseases and and physical ailments and, and now it's more again. it's more psychological now more so than anything else as well it's yeah. i mean it's I, the the joy that i was picking up from from when i visit, when i met ernie dingo and you know i know one person is not uh, representative of entire culture but there was right. this freedom and joy and um just this healthy attitude toward the earth that that was just this breath of fresh air Mm. Um, that I had never, I never experienced before. He was the, he was the first you know, true um, indigenous, uh, well, raised as a hunter gatherer. Now I don't, I don't mm. think, mm. <laughs> I don't think so anymore. But, but um, we've lost something along the way, and I think that um, there's no going back. But we have to somehow figure out how to move, how how to change moving forward. And so, uh, you, know, you when at the introduction, you said you guys are a bunch of twenty, thirty. 30 year olds who clearly you get it. You, you, you're fed up with you know, something is not right. 
we've gone down this avenue that's led us to a point that that we're staring we're staring you know, the apocalypse not in a biblical sense but in an environmental sense we are staring it in the face this is it uh, you know in some ways i've given up on archaeology and i've moved on to to some other things uh because um more talking about this and, and trying to help Muslims and Jews and Christians understand that they're all you know, singing from the same song sheet um, and, and, and that that song sheet is what gives us the keys to saving ourselves from climate change. Um, mm. and there, there, there is another study that apparently there's, there's an upper limit of the human species survivability being 1500 years from now meaning if we if we go to the best of our be best of our efforts to slow down global warming uh the human species will go extinct 1500 years from now the lower limit is 100 years from now and and that's pretty scary and uh, is that is that because of of what we've what we've done to our environment to make it unlivable and not, and not just that but the biomass so we'll start off taper off at a 10 billion sort of population limit uh and if we the, the basically the study said which okay and this kind of leads into back into hugh ross who's used your work he wrote a book called hidden treasures in the book of Job, hmm. where he <laughs> Job, Job is the only one set in South Arabia. He's uh, he's the no. book of Job is in, in Salala, right? And and I've also utilized Job along with your work. And I'll just quickly say this: you mentioned about reed boats. Um, apparently, the gopher, the mention of gopher wood, when God says make the ark out of gopher wood. Um, if you and scholars, Bible scholars have been confused. What does gopher mean? Because it's it's just they don't know what it means, right? So John Walton, uh, one of these engineers and scholars, was uh, picked up on a study uh, done with Akkadian loanwords that if you were to import an Akkadian loanword into that verse in Genesis, it literally says, make an ark out of reeds. So now you have a reed ark, which is, which is exactly that in that region. That's what they were practicing anyway, right? Yeah, and that, that's yeah. yeah, yeah. And just to just to clarify to the audience, so I, so I know you, I know that a, a, a specialist like yourself uh, is saying this. So it's not just me saying this, but is it true that there's there are marsh Arabs that literally have reed like? I, vi I I visited them in um, uh, uh, for a show I did on, on on this. It was one of the most incredible days of my life. Yeah, that's it, that's it, the only way I can depict Noah's Ark is something like. Google, Google Marsh Arabs. Um, I mean, it, the, the, the pictures are absolutely stunning. I mean, yeah, now there are satellite dishes on top of the reed houses. <laughs> but there's, I, I even right. have, um, um, I, I've got one picture where it was, it, was, it was stunning. It was this reed platform. And then, and then, a, and then a, a kind of a house built on top of the platform and we're floating in, in the marshes. And coming out of the house, I just happened to get the picture at the right time. Were all of these cows because they keep the cows inside the house? So it, yeah. was, it was just like literally these cows pouring out of this ark, floating on top of the water. It was but, but you see, that, that's been my argument. Like, and Noah was a farmer because yeah. you see him doing agriculture. The, the the descriptions of the animals on the ark are actually bovine. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is when when yeah. it, it. I mean, it's it's all about contextualizing the story, and so when you put that story back into its its home, which is in the Gulf, um, in the Neolithic period, uh, among okay. the Ubaid yeah. culture, this is who the Ubaid were. They were the they were the ancestors of the Marsh Arabs. They were the original um, reed bundle builders, and in so, fact, all of Sumerian civilization is built out of the marshes is built on top of these reed bundle um they call them turtlebacks uh, mm -hmm. you know these little hilltops these high points in the marshes and eridu which is the um you know, the, the most um uh, that's their pill that's their mecca of, of samaria of ancient samaria mm -hmm. and it um, goes back to ubaid zero to the very beginning of the ubaid period 
Uh, you know, if there was an atom, he was living in everything or, you know, somewhere right. on this right. uh, civilization. I mean, going back to that story, you don't even have to to make much conjecture to get to the Neolithic Revolution because it's spelled out right after um, the punishment from the serpent. He says, well, from now on, it's it. All the food is going to be from the sweat of your brow. Yep. Um, you know, and, and, and you know, Eve being cursed for painful childbirth. Well, certainly women in the Neolithic period in the Near East were having a ton more babies and in, in, were, were, were the fertility rates just skyrocketed, population numbers skyrocketed. Mm. Um, so women were dying in childbirth at a much higher rate just simply because of the numbers of having so many more kids mm. Interesting. Um, from the shift in lifestyle. So mm. all of the things that we read about are, are actually, well, in, the, in this story are, are rooted in the the hellscape that was the, the Neolithic revolution. So we think of it as this, this uh, step forward, but it just opened up all of the problems that we have today uh, mm. in terms of, anyway, in, and then you have this guy uh, 2000 years ago who comes out and says, hey, maybe we shouldn't base our economies on prestige goods and amassing wealth. And, uh, you know, maybe we should think about where we where we came from as a people and more egalitarian and taking it. And, you know, yeah, you saw how, how that worked out for him. And, and you know, <laughs> and, right. and, and, and it's, you know, I just keep waiting for. Um, the, 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 what disturbs me about modern society, civilization in some ways, is that in, in it turning its back as it has on religion, on specifically on Christianity, it's thrown, it's, 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 it almost turned its back on, on his teachings as well. And, 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 oh, and yeah, don't, are... don't get me started on, because that, that, th these are one of these gray areas where I can be critical to the church, but at the same time, I wouldn't be critical about the creedal context of the church. So there's, there's the creedal, the theological, which is, which is true. Yeah. But then the actions of the people, regardless. That, I mean, I think this goes beyond church. This goes to, I mean, in Islam, in, yeah. you know, th th there are so many um, rules for maintaining equality. And, and as soon as money starts flowing into the Arabian Peninsula, now, you, you know, you've, do you right. know, in, in, this is scary in the, in the Hadith, which is the, the oral tradition that mm -hmm. goes with the Quran. Muhammad's asked, well, how will we, how will we know when it's the end of times when the, the Mahdi? Um, will come with the Messiah. And he says, well, we'll know when Arabia becomes green again, becomes affluent again, and the Bedouin build towers or something about that. <laughs> and you think about the Burj Dubai and, and you know, okay, here we are. Mm -hmm. They're doing it. Um, and, you know, here we are. It's the end of times. So um, I, I just, also, I just want to quickly say that um, when you, when you use the word nature and God, Mm -hmm. this, this is something well if you if you know about it then that's awesome but maybe I'm just putting this in here just to kind of make you to blow your mind more a bit which is it blew my mind um, so John in, in the gospel of John the the first verse of John says in the beginning was the word but yeah the, this oh, the, this the is word mysterious yeah, but Logos is, is pretty much going along the same lines of what you're saying. Like Logos and his thinking is connected to God, but I'm gonna now I'm gonna give a quality to God, meaning Logos being rationality and, and thought. And do, and when you go, go to the Chinese Bible, so the translation of the Greek, guess what word they use for logos in Chinese? I'll give you a hint, it's to do with the yin yang. The, the Tao. In the beginning, there was the Tao. Uh, yeah, it, in literally in the Chinese translation, in the beginning was the Tao, and the Tao was with God, and the Tao was God. Like wow. But but now now notice a Chinese person is going to be reading the Gospel of John. They already have a deeply rooted in their culture this Tao and the all the, yep. that stuff associated with Tao, and now it becomes this much more fleshed out like. Oh, okay. I mean, you know, obviously through a Christian context, but Jesus connected to that, and then obviously the God of the Old Testament somehow connected to that. And well, uh, you know, it, yeah. here's since you brought that up, and, and we're in, in leading into the into the mystical aspects of this, is that you get into the, the, the 
beginning of the, the Tao, of the Tao Te Ching, is the Tao that can be stro- spoken is not the true Tao. Um, and the, in Gershon Sholem's Kabbalah, uh, in the Kabbalah, he says that the, it, it's essentially the same line, is that the, the God that you can comprehend is not God. And exactly, yeah. The, the, the one yeah. line that instills so much fear among Westerners when they hear it spoken by an Arab is, you know, Allahu Akbar, <laughs> right? Is exactly that same concept. Is simply, it's, it's simply a reminder that Allah is, it, it's, a, it's it basically Allah is superlative. And your tiny little human brain cannot grasp this concept. This is the, this is the failing of our linguistic system. And, 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 and I, I do believe that. I think you know, we've been saying that over and over throughout this conversation, that we get into trouble over linguistics when we simply, because there's so much loaded into a word, like you know, logos is such a, a tough it's word a to... Word, yeah. Um, I, 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 for me, and I, I don't know where people stand in Bible studies on this now, but, but just the opening line of Genesis says it all to me in, the, in that we can't even agree. Maybe there's agreement, but I, I, I don't agree with the translation of bara, you know, so So, um, you know, in the beginning, Elohim bara the heavens and the earth. Well, he doesn't in Hebrew, he doesn't, why didn't he oseh the heavens and the earth? He didn't make the heavens and the earth because oseh, Elohim oseh, Elohim, the heavens and the earth. No, no, he baraz the heaven and the earth. And that verb is a really weird verb. It's, it's a verb you'd use um, like if you were pouring water into a bucket and you were filling that bucket up, you bara. That, that, that's, that's one context of bara. So it's mm-hmm. not, so, so when we really pull apart that opening line and look at the verb that Elohim is doing to the whatever was there in the beginning, um, he's pouring himself into it, or this, this God is pouring himself into it. So for me, that is the Big Bang. And so there I, I find absolute unity with uh, Hindu understanding, a, a scientific understanding, um, and, and, you know, in this case, the, 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 my own personal Hebrew translation of, of so doing like con- right. So, um, cause people like Michael Heiser will say, oh, just Hebrew linguists will say that bara is always connected with God. Yep. So th- therefore it's a divine activity. And then someone like Hugh Ross, who's a scientist will say, ah, so me as a scientist, when I look at, say, the dark energy parameter of, of the expansion early of the early universe leading up to today, there's a fine-tuning parameter that's so large that he would then equate it to be associated with an in- intentful purpose. It's not a random, lucky happenstance that the universe has a probably. It, it's, it's so engineered to be like that for you and I to even have this conversation. And um, I think... They- that is the, that for me is the logical ending point for the meaning of religion. So, so when, you know, somebody's asked, you know, are you religious or are you not religious? You can have the conversation. You can go for hours and hours and hours. And eventually you'll get to the point you just raised, which is, do we live in a harmonious place or not? Um, and you can, and I, I would argue you can distill any other ideas about religion down to that one um, point of contention is the, is are we just surrounded by chaos? Are we just and, and, and this is why I, I get I get very upset by red by redshift, and I'm really really waiting for this to be disproven. I cannot. Uh, it just does Wait, not adhere to my worldview. You mean redshift as in the expansion as in, factor? Yeah, as in the expansion okay. factor, because I I cannot live in a universe that is just expanding into the void, into nothingness. So, um, wait, do you, do you do you accept the science? You just you just mentally you 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 can't uh, you you I, don't want it to be true sort of thing because it's it just I cannot, makes you uncomfortable. It makes me yeah, yeah. It, I, it it is abhorrent to my to my 
soul to my worldview <laughs> that 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 we are just heading off into into a into, a, into like a void heat of, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I, 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 I would much rather see a, a paper published that says actually um, new evidence suggests that the red shift is, is accelerating inward toward a big crunch and well, in fact uh, that then I'd be much happier with that believe, believe it or not there have been, there was a paper I think it was in two, it's 2009 where and it was um, under the direction of a astrophysicist named Halton Arp, A R P. Um, he was uh, he, he didn't like the Big Bang model, so he held to a, a static state universe, and he looked at a particular quasar. I don't, do you know what a quasar is? Um, okay, so a particular quasar, about thirty billion light years away, which is pretty much we're going back to this to the the age of the universe anyway and the spooky thing about that was that it didn't show any redshift meaning no redshift okay which is okay. going with along with what you're like oh I, I hope there is like no sort of redshift unfortunately um for him and his team uh in 2012 they did a recalibration and there was a tiny little bit of redshift <sighs> So, <laughs> so, 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 you have, I mean, you do have legitimate PhD astrophysicists who, uh, I guess you could say, like to be a little bit unorthodox, like, like not mainstream. So, to, when I say mainstream, I'm saying what's the, the current consensus in yeah. astrophysics, and it's the Lambda CDM Big Bang model and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, but I'm uh, but I'm pointing out that there have been astrophysicists that have thought exactly the way you just thought, gone out to see if that's the case, had I guess you could say brief fame and I guess you could say comfort, <laughs> <laughs> and knowing that it, 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 yeah, we're yeah. going home eventually. Yeah. Um. Okay. Uh, Sorry, Lucas. Go ahead. So uh, I just kind of want to wrap up here get the things uh, and uh, to an end or close but uh, this has been a wonderful uh, gathering uh, two great minds <laughs> really great minds wow just blowing my mind but uh, Jeff how or actually Rob how mm -hmm. would you guys like to collaborate with Hugh Ross yeah so that now, the, honestly, so we, we can wrap up. I just, I just need. Can can I spend five ten minutes on this quickly? Is sure. That, is that possible? Okay. So what I'll do is I'll read what Hugh Ross writes, and definitely, I mean, I, I I'm friends with Hugh Ross. I can message him like, hey, guess who I got in touch with? Uh, it's a guy that you reference in your own book, and uh, so yeah, we we could have that collaboration because he recently has been, and he's about to release a book actually on. Uh, the Pleistocene leading into the Holocene Ice Age sort of scenario. Um, and he's been doing, like, he's written, I think, 20 blogs leading up to this book he's about to release, focusing on just that, the, the most current research on that on that situation. And that's where I got the, the 100 to 1500 year range of our human species when, you know, when we will die out sort of thing. But Hugh Ross says... Um, uh, so Eden's location, so the Garden of Eden. So you have the Tigris and Euphrates mentioned uh, in Genesis 2, but then you have the Pishon, the Gihon rivers also mentioned. Mm -hmm. And um, just to clarify, in your paper or even in your work, did you mention a alluvial fan called the, w the w Wadi al-Batin, I think is, yeah. I I'm mispronouncing yeah. it. But that's from the Hejaz Mountains, right? Going in towards the the Persian Gulf. It it kind of wraps um, almost in a, in an arc, well, around northern Arabia, and then comes into the Gulf around Kuwait. I think I lost you for a sec. Oh, um, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, right. I just got a thing on my phone that the battery was dying. Um, oh. So it, it it wraps around and ends up. Um, in, in dumping into the into the Gulf around Kuwait, a little bit south of Kuwait, 
I'm not so sure now because there are so many drainage systems that would be coming from the southern parts of the Arabian Peninsula, from gold mines um, off the Tuaic Escarpment in Saudi. So what those other rivers are is, or what the, what the um, you know, because I know that in the Bible, they talk about rivers coming from the land of gold and that's that would have to come from Saudi. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. it says so that's that as well. Western, Western Saudi. So that, so that would, that's going to be somewhere, it, it, you know, if you do have this land, gold mines, those are Saudi. Um, and then the Karun, which I think is a little bit more better defined, coming from Iran, coming from the land of, of lapis lazuli and uh, precious stones. Okay. Can you can you still see me? Is, or is it just you? Um, yeah, I can see you. Did I lose video? Let yeah. Me, um, uh, is your phone being charged? Well, I've got my headset in, but let me, hold on, let me try this first of all. And then I'm going to try switching you from headset to... Um, I'm going to plug my battery in, so the sound may get crummy, but that's, at that's least okay. I won't lose the charge. One sec. All right. Headset off. Battery in. How's that for sound? That's fine. Yeah, I can still hear you. Okay? Yeah. Yep. All right. Okay, so I'll just read out what he says, and then I'll quickly show you my PowerPoint, and then um share your thoughts so hero says um the details here point in the direction of the hejaz a mountainous region in the west central part of saudi arabia the 6000 foot range contains the only known source of workable gold in the region so this is what we you just mentioned the land of kush has long been identified with ethiopia and the horn of africa given that the bab el mandeb Strait and much of the Red Sea were dry near the end of the last ice age, uh, some uh, between 50,000 and 15,000 years ago. Kush would have included the mountains in Arabia's southwestern corner. Both the Hejaz Mountains and the mountains in the southwest corner of the Arabian Peninsula were well watered as recently as 5,500 years ago. Satellite imagery reveals the dry beds of two major rivers that once flowed from west central and southwestern arabia into the persian gulf region ice and snow atop ice and snow atop mountains in those parts of arabia would have fed both rivers today only the tigris and euphrates still flow continuously however toward the close of the last ice age all four rivers were mighty watercourses and and just just to quickly um button here there's another scholar, uh, James Hoffmeyer. Now he's an Egyptologist. That he, is. yeah. So Hoffmeyer would be uh, he's he, he's from the Hebrew. I mean, he's an Egyptologist department. He collaborated in this book called um, Counterpoints. It's a, it's and it was it's on Genesis. And he, so this. I'm sure you're aware of the uh, the Wellhausen hypothesis of the Torah, like the JEDP, yeah. um, the Yahweh's Elohist, all that. So scholars who hold to that theory say that the Genesis 2 chapter is a 600 BC text. It's, it's, a, it's a mix of a Yahwist sort of uh, and priestly sort of thing. Hoffmeyer is like, okay, this Wadi al-Batin river thing that, that we're talking about, that dried up 3,000 years prior. So how did the author of, of chapter 2 know about this river um, in the 600 BC era when actually something like, like this, is, this is a memory that they had to have had of this, this particular river because um, it dried up 3,000 years prior. So I, I mean, I just find a fact. Is that true? Is there any coherence in that, in that argument? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the, the whole idea. I mean, all of these thoughts that, if you read Genesis from that perspective, you think, well, how did they know that there was a seafaring civilization around the Gulf during the yeah. Neolithic? How did they know it disappeared overnight? How did they know? You know, you can you can go and and and, and do that over and over again, and and. And so, wow, they got all of this stuff 
reasonably correct. Um, it, the the, um, um, the other example would be the um, um, you know, well, certainly these lost cattle herders, uh, which were there in the Quran and they're sort of mentioned in the Bible. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this, how did they know that there was a lost uh, civilization of, of militant uh, cattle herders that were tall in Southern Arabia? How is it possible these oral traditions hung on for so long? And the one that I, I, I alluded to a few times earlier in our chat was, so I, I was writing my, my book and trying to explain, in particular, the poem that I, that I read to you that we talked about in the Quran from, mm -hmm. from so Surah 89, Ayah 7 through 12, where it mentions these different things, the people of Ad um, that were destroyed, and then it talks about Aram Dati al Ahmad. And I had come up with a theory that I was, I was like, okay, tent poles must be talking about a nomadic civilization, and and but the line is Aram Dati al Ahmad, Aram of the of the lofty pillars, the likes of which the world had never seen before. And it just, you know, it didn't really fit. It just didn't, you know, it wasn't a very satisfying parsimonious explanation for all the other things that I had looked at. Mm. And then I, I and then I, I, as you do when you're writing, you, and you, you get lost. And I got lost writing about the Neolithic Revolution, and I ended up in Turkey. And, and, and I ended up talking about... You just sort of, I, I mean, maybe it's just me, but I sort of wander from interest to interest. And I was following the Neolithic Revolution and all its different manifestations. And I ended up in Gobekli Tepe and talking about Gobekli Tepe and, and how um, it was a strategy for dealing with climate change, for dealing with the end of this incredibly productive, fertile period. The, the human response was to cooperate. And, and to work together and to develop yeah. symbols and, and worship together. And they came together to you know, um, feast and have a good time and have these ritual ceremonies. So I'm writing about Gobekli Tepe and it, not just Gobekli Tepe, but there's 20 or 30 other sites in the region of the Northern Euphrates. So if, you, if we've got the Fertile Crescent and we've got the first farmers um, kind of here in the Levant area, and then you've got up in the northern Euphrates, these you know, strain at the very top of the crescent, you've got these, these people who, who make sites like Gobekli Tepe, and then you come down the Mesopotamian side of the crescent, and it's much more animal focused on domesticated cows and goats, and, um, and, then, and then eventually a full on commercial economy based on growing wheat, but that's that happens. Mm. That happens later when they get free labor, when they've got uh, cheap labor to dig the irrigation canals. But um, but earlier on, when when you have the site of Tepe, which is the oldest, as we know, it's the oldest temple in the world, the oldest known structure of anything like that in the world. And I'm writing about, and I I had, I had visited the site. I had done a show on the site, um, looking at how they made these seven meter tall decorated stone pillars that were gods. I mean, these are interpreted. And I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a pretty strong interpretation to, to see these things as gods. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they don't have faces, but they have arms like this. And there'll be a ring of 12 around the perimeter, 10 to 12 around the perimeter, and then two central standing stones in the, in, in the middle of the enclosure. These are all, all the enclosures are dug into the ground. The two standing stones are carved. They've got symbols all over them. Um, th these are 10,000 year old structures. I mean, this is so far before any other stone circle or monumental architecture of its kind. Um, in one case, the one is wearing a, 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 a necklace with a crescent with a, with a star in the middle of it, which is you know, both which, which goes to the, as, as, like an astrological sort of zodiacal. That and also it's it's the modern symbol of Turkey, you know. So yeah, you think about right, these symbols right. just getting passed yeah, yeah. along down 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 the line, even when we don't know we're doing it. Right. Um, and then the other one has bull horns, and those two images are mm. so central to all Mesopotamian um, mythology. You know, the bull, the sacred bull. Mm. Um, 
so I'm writing about this this site, and 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 the book that I wrote is being translated into Arabic. So in the back of my mind, I was I was playing like little word games, trying to leave them little traps here and there of um, play, play, you know, of you, well, my very limited Arabic, but trying to play, you know, little play on words here and there. And I got to Gobekli Tepe, which is a, a settlement of lofty pillars, of giant T-shaped pillars. The only word in Arabic that they can possibly use is Ahmad. And so suddenly, hmm. like, like, wait a minute. And I'm thinking about that poem in, in, um, chapter 89 and thinking, wait a minute, what if these tent poles, the, the Aram, the Dati al Ahmad, what if that line isn't referring to Aram of the tent poles, but what if it really is Aram of the lofty pillars? And how, the likes of which- Which could be connected to that topic. Yeah, right, right. And then, well, how, and this is now, you know, 8,000 BC, 7,000 BC, how is it possible that Muhammad can have the cultural memory, even if the site was completely demolished, it must have been so have mostly you... buried um, by 600 AD when he was around. Right. How could he remember this? How could have you, have, you back... the, have you consulted the tafsir on that particular ayah? Or... Um, yeah, I, there are billions of Possible. Interpretation that that, uh, that, uh, that ayah is, is one of the most divisive in the entire Quran. Just for okay. you know, what what could this place be? Um, but I'm so I'm, I'm looking at it from from this perspective. And I think well, place names. Okay, what what would this place in the northern Euphrates, this region of the northern Euphrates, be known as? It wasn't Turkey. So what was the, the, the name to a Semitic speaking, central Semitic speaking person in the, you know, either the first millennium BC or AD, what, what would he have known it as? Mm -hmm. Sure enough, Aramea. This is Aram. So Aram, Dati, al Ahmad, Aram of the lofty temples. So, uh, so, so there's a, another one of these, and I, you know, like I said, I didn't even set out to solve that myth or or anything but it just the, the when the when you when you plug the linguistics in when you plug the archaeology and the whole context in to that whole poem um you're left with 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 possibly evidence i mean certainly he talks about pyramids in that poem he's talking mm. about the pharaohs he's talking about people who went and built all of these grand structures and that they're now been wiped off the face of the earth and nothing is left of, of of their endeavors you've definitely out of out of everything in the quran that i've looked at um which again is not exhaustive but at the same time is is, is quite uh, quite a quite a lot um kind of like that that goofy thing with the ur the chaldean sort of thing i see that a lot in the quran but you mentioning about surah 89 that's actually very interesting. I'm going, to, I'm going to look into that, see see what I can dig up. Um, and, so yeah, and, 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 sharing that. Yeah, and I, and I and I think that that if I can just go and and, and go back and and the meaning of that of that poem, which is the most beautiful part about it, is that if you build out of wood, we're going to send a dust storm and and turn your structures upside down. If you carve out of stone, we'll wipe it out with an earthquake. If you mm. um, if you build if you waste all your resources on pyramids, you, you're not going anywhere. Um, whatever, whatever you do, if you put your energy as a society into pride, hubris, um, competition, into anything that doesn't feed back into the earth and to take care of the earth, if you're just wasteful with all of your resources, you're going to end up like everyone else. And here we are today. You want to run a civilization off of fossil fuels? Fine, but you're going to burn. And, 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 and it's, it, it's the exact same Smoke thing. We'll cook. <laughs> we're cooking ourselves, just like every, you know, they, they all did it to themselves in the past, and now we're cooking ourselves. And, um, you know, now more than ever, we need the, all of this ancient wisdom that we've thrown out the window. We need it back. Um, right. I'll, I'll just I'll just finish off what Hugh says. Um, 
so again, I, you sharing all that stuff just then, it's not gone to waste. So it's it's being recorded. So that's that's good. Um, so yeah, he talks about the uh, the river, and then he gets he mentions you by name. <laughs> so, he, <laughs> so he goes. Uh, if most of the Persian Gulf were dry at that time, so he's obviously positing, say, 50,000 years ago. Um, so if most of the Persian Gulf were dry at that time, as researchers believe it was, all four rivers would have come together in a place that is now under the southeastern part of the Persian Gulf. This place seems the most likely location for Eden. Recent archaeological... No, this is your work. Recent archaeological discoveries lend support to a Persian Gulf location for Eden, University of Birmingham archaeologist Jeffrey Rose reported on the discovery of more than 60 new archaeological sites, all dating back more than 7,500 years along the Persian Gulf's current shoreline. Ro Rose describes them in some detail. Quote, these settlements boast well-built permanent stone houses, long-distance trade networks, elaborately decorated pottery, domesticated animals, and even evidence for one of the oldest boats in the world, unquote. Rose reasons that during the latter part of the la last ice age, a thriving civilization existed in what is now the Persian Gulf as sea levels rose and water rushed in through the Strait of Hormuz. Is that mm -hmm. pronounced mm -hmm. correctly? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so the Strait of Hormuz, to begin filling up the Persian Gulf, people would have exited the Gulf Oasis and formed settlements along the rising shoreline. Now, he's, he published this book in 2014, and the paper I talked about, uh, about the the Strait of Hormuz, where that natural the gap, of it. Yeah. yeah, that was a year later, so 2015, the paper was published. Basically, before the paper was published, uh, it was kind of like a consensus that the the Persian Gulf was was filling up over a very long period of time. We're talking centuries, you know, onwards. Whereas he argued that uh, the the speed at which the water was coming in was like forty kilometers an hour, and it it took like a year to, for the whole of the Persian Gulf just to be flooded. Um, I think that that, that I, might be... I don't know. Have you come across that? Or? No, there's no. no evidence. I mean, I, I know the argument that there, that essentially... And the argument makes sense from a landscape formation process perspective because all of the dunes of, of Arabia, all of the dunes that, that have accumulated and built up around Hormuz, it comes from the seabed of the Gulf. So sand accumulates when sea levels are low and it blows out of these 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 lower areas yeah. um, so it makes sense that that while that sea level was lower and, and you have prevailing winds that come down from from the northwest toward the, toward the southeast so it would make sense that the prevailing winds would create some kind of a, a, a dam or a barrier at Hormuz. whether or not that created this you know instantaneous flood um, I, I don't think there's any evidence for it there's any evidence for a massive flooding into the basin um but the other thing i would i would say and, and i never thought i would hear myself saying this is that when you look at the, the the words when you look at the description and i'm not one to put privacy on text but when you look at the description across so many different traditions it's they're describing a cyclone and you know, parsim what, what, what I'm what I'm trying to find parsimony. You know, the, the simplest, most logical explanation that requires the least amount of special requirements. The cyclone seems to fit. You know, the most. You know, the forty days is um, that's added you know, much much later right. on. Yep. Seven days in all the original stories, and seven days is about the time for a, a mega cyclone to come do its damage, and then die down and, and give everyone a, a reprieve. Um, so, and plus you also have the, the actual sea level coming up two, three meters higher right around this time period, right around 4200, 4100 BC. 
So I would that, um, just quickly would that fit the twenty two feet? Because when it says fifteen cubits, that the water is no, broke. no. This this okay. was about this would be no more than about ten feet. I would I would guess. Okay, Five all right. Because yeah. um, because again, that paper that I that twenty fifteen paper said, which I've again, it it just made me go what you know. Uh, he said about twenty one feet. Which is very close to the twenty-two point five feet, which is the fifteen cubit, because it's very precise. It's very clean, fifteen cubits. It's not like say, thirteen point two cubits. You know, the 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 ancient math they give like estimations at a very clean level. But yeah, I just found that interesting because isn't the Persian Gulf like like mostly flat? If there was no water there, it, it it's it's a low line. Yeah, it's to it's. it's yeah, if you yeah. take the water out, Eastern Arabia just just gradually, slowly, gently dips down. Right, and and that that coastline you know, is ten meters, twenty meters. 30, you know, it's nothing. It's it's so shallow. There, there's one central basin that's 140, 50 meters deep. So that would never have been exposed. But just a, that, that's just a, 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 a kind of a trench running right up the middle. Um, up to the, the the river valley, and then you have the Urshat River Valley, which is the the you know, on the scale of the Nile in terms of stream flow and volume that that, that was emptying out through there. Um, mm -hmm. So I've, I've the, the the other interesting um, bit is that when Leonard Woolley, and this was what 1921, 22, when he was digging around Ur looking for the flood, and that was that was the big thing everybody was out doing. Nobody. Could conceptualize of a flood that that was before the Sumerian civilization. Nobody could could get their head around that these stories might be oral traditions that predate writing systems. So there was a very um, three thousand two thousand BC could must be somewhere around then. So when Leonard Woolley excavated Ur and goes down beneath the Sumerian levels. He get he gets to the Uruk level, which is about 3,800, 38 to 3,200 BC, and then mm -hmm. separating the Uruk level from the from the Ubaid level beneath it is a thick layer of sand. So, and so he's yeah he concludes that there had been a tremendous flood that ended the the Ubaid before the Uruk civilization started which up. Which is what you you mentioned much earlier on in this discussion. But, yeah, yeah. So he had he had it in his hands, but but he just couldn't. Uh, they just couldn't couldn't conceive of it being four thousand BC as opposed to uh, thirty one hundred BC or twenty nine hundred BC. Okay. Uh, but now, but you know, I think that, that when you look at, like we said right at the beginning of the conversation, when you look at uh, Australian Aboriginal people, when you see a seven thousand year old oral tradition surviving for that long then in that context, I'd be surprised if we didn't have stories. I mean, it, it would be weirder not to have stories from, from the early Neolithic and from the, you know, these, these incredibly impactful events in human history. Right. All right, I'm going to finish the paragraph. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. Uh, so yeah, settlements along the rising shoreline. And then this is just the last paragraph where he says, Hans Peter Urpmann, an archaeologist at Eberhard Karls University, um, Tubingen, Tubingen? I don't know. Tubingen. Tubingen. Um, recently uncovered remains of the most ancient human settlements yet found. Three villages at the base of Jebel Faya. A limestone mountain rising a thousand feet above current sea level in the United Arab Emirates. A research. Yep. He was yeah, he was conflating a few different, completely unrelated um, discoveries there. So the Jebel Faya okay. discovery it wasn't a settlement. It was a, it was just a um, a cave that had been occupied by some species. We don't know if they're modern humans. We don't know if if they were some sort of archaic Neanderthal. Um, but it was a cave level that dates to probably 120,000 years ago. Um, and it's okay. it, very little. I, I, it, Jebel Fai has caused a lot of problems, caused a lot of confusion um, 
because the excavators came out and made an announcement about the site and then it got the full um, press treatment. And then they, they pulled back on that announcement. And there was a huge backlash from the archaeological community that when uh, we don't agree with your interpretation of this evidence. And, and so now it's, it sits in this, in, in this um, roasts in confusion. Mm, okay. In this broth of confusion. Interesting. So, well, then, well, he continues on with Orpman, and he says, mm -hmm. a research team led by Orpman uh, published un uncalibrated, optically stimulated luminescent dates of 31,000 to 43,000 years ago, which is kind of like what you were saying about 20,000. Um, that's, that's their, um, that's their, what's called assemblage A which is um, a technology that um, we don't know what it is. We don't know, okay. we don't know who's making it and what it is. Okay. Um, for the most recent of the three, well, he says th these dates, uh, for the most recent of the three settlements and 82,000 to 143,000 years ago for the most ancient. Is, is that... So the, yeah, and, 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 and I think what, what this goes to show um, is there was a lot of, remember I, right at the beginning of the conversation, there was a lot of different human populations at right. the time modern humans came onto the scene. And I, my argument, and, and this is a, a cultural argument, this is the fact that the, the, the stone tools they were making at Jebel Faya are incredibly primitive and the traditions don't really map you know uh, he says talk about three different settlements or three different um occupation levels at the site and 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 each one is different than the other so there's no continuity between them uh, the technology they use is very primitive and, and this is why I say Jebel Faya causes a lot of confusion because we don't know who these people are. We don't know if they're modern humans. We don't know what they look like in terms of skeletal evidence. Now, having said that, since 2015, there's been a, a renewed excavation inside the rock shelter and they've found new data, which... Um, so, so this is the year after this was published. <laughs> so this was this yeah. was um, it's and it's and it's actually still. I mean, some of it's not even published yet, and I'm just, okay. I'm just, here, I'm just getting getting here hearsay on yeah, okay. uh, the new dates. But apparently, they've got uh, similar to what we just published a few weeks ago. So that site um, in in Dofar with dates of about thirty thousand, um, where they're making the bows and arrows. So I think they have similar bow and arrow weapons from about 30,000 years ago, which okay. would be phenomenal because that's, you know, that's putting people, that's putting an advanced group of hunters in the Gulf at the right time um, when they're supposed to be there, certainly in a busy surviving the last ice age. Mm, right. Okay. Um... Although, so well, I think I, I think in a way he's kind of agreeing with what you just said. In, in the next line, he says, "Although the lack of calibration means the dates could be off by a factor of two or three, approximately several tens of thousands of years, these finds still rank these finds still rank as the oldest known village remains." Yeah. They're, okay. It's not a village. Uh, um, no. It's, it's, oh, okay. it, no. These are these, and this is this is um, my problem is that. I would even describe some of that stuff as middle Paleolithic. I'd almost describe it as lower Paleolithic. Okay. In 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 a, in a very Homo erectus kind of hand axes, um, crude core technology. Okay. And, and 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 so my argument is 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 that you have different groups coming into the Arabian Peninsula or hanging around in the Arabian Peninsula at the time that modern humans show up on the scene. But modern humans. I, I guess you could say the early, uh, the early anatomically modern human. So I don't even know if these guys are anatomically the, the people from Jebel Faya and around the Gulf, right? Um, because it's a refugium, it's it's the last place you're going to get a holdover of the previous 
iteration mm, okay. of the previous prototypes. Mm. Um, whereas, so, so, so then you get place like where I work in Dofar, where you have these Nubians moving in. Mm. Same time period as Jebel Faya, that's about 110,000 years ago. And remember I was saying earlier that all they know how to do is make killing equipment and they mm. make beautiful, I mean, it's gorgeous stuff. And the technology is, it, the skill that it requires and the teaching that it requires is, is I mean, I, I, it would take years for me to learn how to do it and, and never probably be able to do it with the precision that they can do it. Mm. Uh, and, 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 and what's, so here we have a technology that is identical on both sides of the Red Sea and it lasts for 50,000 years. I and mean, we've got dates from, from Egypt, we've got dates from Oman, we've got dates from um, Saudi now. And it's the same technology, this very advanced way of killing things. That's what they do, they kill things. So the, the two things we can take out of this about who we are as a species, we are expert killers and we are expert at transmitting, experts at transmitting our culture. And, and, and that, that caricature of these very first people to, to settle the Arabian Peninsula and come out of Africa, I think, continues to this day is, is our, our, our cultural identity of who mm. we are. We're, we are bloodthirsty storytellers. That's very true, actually. I mean, We're all, I can, all I, can, I can think of is if you... Did you see the Russell Crowe Noah movie? Yes. Remember, yes. remember that beautiful scene where, which I think is just brilliant, where when Noah is recounting the fall of humanity while they're on the boat, you know, while the flood's happening, and he's got his family together, and he's saying, uh, he, he goes through the process of creation and then the evolution of things, and then finally you see the first act of the Cain and Abel story, where the axe is coming down to kill, so Cain's about to kill Abel, yeah. and then the, the, the movie, the, the filmmaker juxtaposes centuries worth of different uh races of humans like like technologically as well as culturally and ethnically ranging from the ancient to the modern like like soldier with with with, uh, with a gun yeah it's just I, I mean what you just said you know is in that one scene alone yeah yeah i mean uh, you yeah. think about the, the you know what's the one thing that that brought us from a state of, oops, <laughs> I think I, I lost you again yeah. there. Uh, the no, no, I'm, I'm here. And what's the, you know, the one thing that brought us from a state of, of you know, homo habilis to, to where we are today? And that one thing is stone tools. And, right. and, and if, if you follow the evolution of a stone tool, it evolves into the, the, the nuclear warheads that, that are, capable of, of wiping out everything that we've accomplished over the last 3.3 million yeah, years. And, according yeah, to Einstein, yeah. you'll go back to stone tools again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll, I'll quickly, okay, so then, so he, so he, I guess you or us, uh, so if, 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 if we, if you get, if we get you back on, we get Huros back on, maybe you can, Clarify that with Huros, and mm -hmm. then he says. So this is the he, he concludes mentioning you again. He says. So in his paper, Rose points out that during the late Pleistocene era, which would be between one hundred fifty thousand to twelve thousand years ago, reduced sea levels periodically expose what's called the Gulf Oasis. The Persian Gulf receded far enough to expose a landmass as large as or larger than Great Britain. Rose reports this landmass was well watered by four rivers fed at the same time by snow and ice melt, the Tigris, Euphrates, Karun, and Wadi al Batin. Freshwater springs fed by subterranean aquifers beneath the Arabian subcontinent also watered the region. Such an abundant, well distributed freshwater supply and the region's warm weather could have supported a lush agricultural enterprise. This description of the Gulf Oasis fits well with the Genesis 2 portrayal of Eden. Yeah. Um, is is and, that an accurate representation of your work? Um, yeah, I, th I, I, I think absolutely. I, 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 would, I would agree with that. Um, okay. The, what, what we don't have today is, is any 
modern metaphor for this type of landscape. And in, it's, it's been written about a lot among academics about these emergent seashells mm -hmm. during, during the last ice age, throughout the last ice age, and that you have these unbelievably resource-rich zones that no longer exist and, mm -hmm. and, and are, and are you know, periodically sea level dips down far enough to expose one of them. And just you know, because it's seabed, it's just full of biomass. And so not, you don't even necessarily need full-blown agricultural cultivation, but um, you can, there's enough food that you can get by with intensive gathering and intensive hunting, like we see in, um, in, in the area around Galilee in, in, in the period of the Epipaleolithic, so between 20 and 12,000 years ago. Uh, people are doing really well. I mean, this is, to me, the Garden of Eden is a site called, if you want to know about the Garden of Eden, Ohalo 2, which is, it's under the sea seabed of the um, Sea of Galilee. So it's a little bit outside of our, oh, yeah. you know, the, Gar the Garden of Eden we're talking about here. But in mm. terms of conditions, Eden-like conditions, it's a little hamlet of, you know, a couple families, three, four families living together at the side of the, the, uh, of the sea, um, everything is built out of reeds and they've got little flowers planted. You, you've actually been able to get the pollen to determine this, but they've got flowers planted at the entrance to the house. Um, little, you know, just this idyllic landscape, low population density, high landscape carrying capacity. Um, and, and, that's, and that's what Eden was, I think. It was a place where... Um, food just threw itself at you. And you know, these guys had made it through the last ice age. And okay. sudden, suddenly they're, they're living in not only a world of plenty, but a world where there's fog for three months out of the year. Uh, we talked about the, the mists yeah. from the deep coming yeah. up. And that's that, that's that monsoon invading annually between January, uh, sorry, between June and, and uh, September coming up into the peninsula. Um, it's a land of fruit and dates and you know the irony is you're talking about milk and honey that's where the milk and honey is not up north uh, you know, the, right. the milk is in the south um, so that that's exodus onward is an entire different discussion for, for another night yeah, uh, yeah. because I, we could do a whole another night on, on the yam hasof and oh, uh, yeah. on yeah. the yam sof and, and the actual location of yam sof but that's that's a different conversation the, the bitter lakes um, I, uh, I I translate "sof" as the end instead of the instead of "read" the end. So when I so when, when it says the and the and and, the, and the, when they fled the the pharaoh, you know they're not it's not they're not they're not fleeing. Um, you know, it's not Charlton Heston leading leading them away from um, uh, you know what's his name who played Ramses. Yeah, okay. um, um, I, I don't know. They, they weren't sitting there building pyramids in Cairo. They were down in in southern Egypt, carving statues for Ramses, these Apiru slaves. So mm. in, in Exodus, when we, when we hear the story of of them being led, they did not go the way of the Philistines. They went the long way round to um, the Yam Sof, and they okay. don't say they don't say. You know the, the the Red Sea. The Red the word Red Sea doesn't appear anywhere in that passage. Yeah. Mm. So if, you know how you know how with Hebrew with ancient Hebrew you can have you don't have vowel pointers. So mm -hmm. it can be a vav or it can be a a, 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 a wa or a, a, a o or u. And that's, and that's why you have certain added consonants to give you the phonetic. You know so, to, because that would be their equivalent of a vowel before the vowels were, were placed in. Yeah, so, uh, so, so in this case, you've got the vav, but you don't know if it's an u or an o vav. So is yeah. it yam hasuf or yam hasuf? And if it's yam hasuf, it's the sea of reeds, which right. even then we kind of have to stretch it to make it sound anything like the Red Sea. But if it's yam hasuf, it's the end of the sea. So then I, this is where I would, obviously we don't, we're not going to get into an Exodus discussion now, but <laughs> I can see Lucas is laughing. Uh, Michael Heiser runs what's called the Naked Bible Podcast, uh, and that, and he emphasizes the word naked there because that's the point. He goes, he makes it naked. He he strips it all away from tradition and creeds and like kind of that that then we Christians seem to look at it through filters, so like denominational yeah. filters. Um, and he's currently in he's doing a series on Exodus, per like like 
in a very scholarly context. And he's just released episodes on uh, ch from chapter 12 up to 14. And he tackles, and James Hoffmeyer is included in that, in that discussion where, in fact, let me put it this way, University of San Diego, California, uh, is it UC, UC, I, th I think it is, yeah, University of San Diego, because because I'm going blank on that. There's a California. They, they have a biblical, a long standing biblical program that, uh, with, with Tom Levy, a guy called Tom Levy's also there. So, it, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. He, they had a Exodus conference in 2013, which I've uploaded on my channel. It's like 24 hours long. So, I've, I've, I've spliced it into two 12 hour, <laughs> two or 12 hour videos. But basically, they had like 40 scholars coming on this thing called Israel's. Uh, exodus in an interdisciplinary sort of thing. So ranging from ancient Near East, then the biblical context, and believe it or not, even the Quran was included in that. Um, and one of my, one of the things that really fascinated me was the route that you were talking about. They had they had a geologist come in, a geophysicist, and when the Exodus speaks about a strong wind all night, yeah. that that could actually cause the waters to recede. And then when the wind stops, then you have like a tsunami effect coming back in, especially if you're talking about those lakes. Well, they're pretty large in that area, which would the Yamsuf would be connected to. And um, and yeah, um, there's 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 the, there's a lot um, to, when you when you when when I only just recently started tugging on this thread, and it, and it just brought me to some weird places. Uh, you know, the fact that genetically speaking, if we if we take the Exodus as a nation building story authored by Kohanim uh, Levite scribes, um, then, then, you know, we, we, we've, we've, we've got the authors, we know where they're, where they're coming from a little bit, but then when you, as I said earlier in the conversation, when you look at the genetic history of the, of the Kohen, especially the Kohanim, and there's something we, we have the Kohen modal haplotype, which shows up, um, you know, among people with last name of Kohen, Khan, you, know, you name it, and it, mm -hmm. it, it, it's there. And it does seem to be a legitimate marker. Um, but what's interesting is it's it, incredibly high percentages in, in South Arabian populations, in, in the Jewish population, Yemeni Jews, for instance, incredibly in Ethiopian Jews. But the countries where it appears highest in non-Jewish people is Ethiopia, Yemen, and Southern Oman. And Saudi Bedlam, and when you then so then you think, who were these Kohanim that are telling us these stories about fleeing Egypt, crossing Red Sea? Hmm. Uh, well, their genetics are in Southern Arabia. Um, the people who I, I mentioned that I work with people who don't speak Arabic; they speak a, a modern South Arabian, a dialect of Mahri of modern South Arabian. Um, and for 20 years, they've been telling me, you know, I show up and I'm, I'm, I'm very, um, I, I don't hide my religion. I, you know, we, we chat about it. Like I said, I'm not religious. So we just, you know, it's, it's, it's a subject of curiosity more than anything so else. Just quickly, are you like an agnostic or a spiritual? No, no, no. I'm, I was raised Jewish um, and um, identify culturally as Jewish. Uh, but, but religious, you know, I think the, you know every book has got truth in it, and and so I don't I, I don't like taking on a name because I think they're all there's truth everywhere, okay. um, in, in in all of these different traditions. So um, they, they've been telling me for twenty years that oh yeah, yeah we're Hebrew. What, what 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 you're Hebrew? What are you talking about? You're Hebrew. you're Mahri. You're you're you know you're Arabs. You're you live right. in southern southern Oman. What are you talking about? And sure enough, as we learn more and more about genetics and about who these people are, and well, they, they got there. They showed up there about 3,000, 3,500 years ago um, with a language system that split from Proto-Sinaitic, which becomes Hebrew. So their language is actually a, 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 the other branch of Proto-Sinaitic, which ends up um, as a written alphabet in South Arabian. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to this day, they still, among their tribal elders, they maintain that they're 
you know, everyone else in the Arabian Peninsula, they're the descendants of, of Ishmael. We are of Isaac and Jacob. And the fact that they still have this, and, and in fact, we just found a, I hate to, we, we just found a, a, literally a lost city called Tabirut, which is Hab the place of the Habiru, with, 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 with <laughs> okay. old garden structures. And so the, wow. the story just gets, the rabbit hole gets weirder and weirder and weirder as we pull in all these different threads uh, in Southern Arabia. But, 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 well, know, I'm, I'm definitely going to look into that because that, again, that's a whole different discussion. And Yeah. I mean, the, the identity of the Habiru has been a real eye opener in terms of, um, uh, you know, you know the, the, the concept of the Habiru or the Apiru. Of the, mm. the, 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 uh, I think that needs a lot more fleshing out to understand who wrote the Bible, who was telling these stories around their campfires for so mm -hmm. long. Mm. Um, and, and to get, you know, to, to, to get at that, you got to get at the, these Habiru yeah. people, Bronze Age and then, people. And then on top of that, on top of that, Heiser will, so Michael Heiser of the Naked Bible podcast, he will, being an, a Christian, but very sensitive to the scholarship you're, you're talking about, he would tack onto that and say, the fact that these stories have survived the way they have, there's this thing called providence at work. And that's where he, he can't help but shake off the feeling that it's, it's too providential uh, okay, we're not like. Let's just, for the sake of argument, say that maybe Moses was like the prime author, but at the same time, you have an editorial process on top of that. All right, whatever. But the point is, the fact that it's now preserved the way it is, and then you see that the text is fine-tuned to 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 leave in what's necessary and the things that are left out. Is also a necessary thing, which is a peculiar thing. It, it doesn't need to yeah. give uh, an unnecessary amount of detail. It's just the right amount of information for us to then put the pieces together and and then see the whole coherence of it. And, and, and the, the, the tradition in the Quran, which is that yeah. which is that this is an ongoing process, and that while there are passages which people have no idea about in the past, they when it's when it when the time is right, uh, the meaning presents itself, as it were, right. okay. and, and is, is revealed, um, is, is, unfolds. And, and, I, and, I, and I, I, I don't understand it, but I, but I, I, I see it. It's, and it's hard for me, I mean, this is, a, as a scientist, yeah, it's hard to, to see all of the providence. Uh, it's a good term. I, 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 I'm glad, I'm, it's nice to have a word for it. But to see all of this just um, coincidences to the point where you almost think, all right, this is just taking the piss now. Uh, <laughs> I'll, give, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you one example. Um, the, 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 we name archaeological cultures based on the place we find them first. So there's a, a famous, in, in Southern Arabia, there's a famous culture group I work with called the Facade Faces, based on the types of stone tools they make. Facade is, um, it's an Arabic word, not the French word. And we, so we've, you know, archaeologists have been using this term for 30 years now, running around calling it, oh, the facade faces. And it refers to all the people of Southern Arabia from 12 to 8,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out the word facade, and I only discovered this when I was writing my book, the word facade um, is, the, is the key of the poem in, in chapter 89 about the people of Ad. People of Ad, have you heard about the people of Ad? Did you look what they did in their land, their Balad? They made a total facade. They, they corrupted it. <laughs> the facade. And in fact, the reason that we've been going around calling these stone tool types facade is because they were found in a part of the desert called Ramla, which means the dunes, Ramla mm -hmm. facade, the, the dunes of corruption, the corrupted dunes. So there's an entire area of the southern sands that, that's this corrupted, you know, defiled land um, where we've taken the term, it's, it, you know, it's gone from mythology into archaeology and then fed back into mythology. Now that we know that these people, these are the odd, these are the, the corrupted people themselves. And we as archaeologists have been running around calling them the corrupted people for 40 mm. years without even knowing what, the, that, that, what that word meant and that they were, in fact, 
the corrupted people. Um, yeah. So it, you know, the name came out long before um, you know any of the meaning was there behind it. So I mean, there had been a lot of um, head scratching moments where you you can't not see um, harmony in 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 the way things unfold, and um, that's yeah, and that that's what I have come that that's where, where this whole journey has brought me in 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 learning about trying to understand the book. What is this? Torah, Quran, and, and all these stories, and not and not just that, and not just that, but but the, this is what I want to show the, the Christian community, but but um, not you see again, I, I'm not, I don't want to throw, for example, Lucas in the, in the chat, or even Hunter earlier, uh, or just just the people that that enjoy this YouTube channel of mine, the Sentinel, which because I I pull together from Christian scholars. Um, who, who are open to being challenged and corrected, and the peer review process and all that. So, for example, Ken Ham, the young creationist crowd, they're so monolithic in their thinking that no, this is it. There's no other way. That, you know, Ken Hoven, the Ken Hovens of of the church, they they are not open to to being shown. This is right. Or, or this can change, you know, with more evidence, more data. I just wanted to show everyone that I go hand in hand with Jeff's perspective here, his epistemology. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, kind of like uh, what Paul says in the New Testament: uh, "Test everything, <laughs> put all things to the test, seek what's true and good." Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, it's, it's been very. Yeah. We, 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 we as a civilization, we need to come back to this. You know, we need our, our, our lost wisdom. Uh, we need the soul of our, of our culture to, you know, to return because we are just, I mean, just spinning our head in circles and, and the injustice and the, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And it, it feels like, as an anthropologist, it, it feels like it's coming to a head. And... Mm. Um, in, 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 in this kind of a dialogue is what gets us out of it. Um, it, it. It's saying, hey, you know, the people that came before us were not dumb. They had a lot of wisdom to impart, and we need to learn from them. One, okay, let's, let's, now let's just bring it to a close. So one final thing is I'm going to share my, tell me, tell me if you can actually see this clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, on your phone. Okay. Yeah. So this this is my 88 slide <laughs> you know thing I made on Lowe's flood and I, I go through it you know I, I just give a, a more of a concordist sort of approach so I so for example this slide I talk about the engineering and cosmology of the flat earth the solid dome all that stuff and then on this slide I, I want to showcase how it remarkably also aligns with our modern understanding of of evolution and the big bang and all that but that this this is more of a what i mean since you're you're jewish you'd understand it yeah, pesha like pesha exegesis it's it's a type of interpretation that even the early jews uh would practice um kind of like the prophecies in the old testament with jesus um mm -hmm. it, it had its original context but then it had its like dual application with jesus so I go through basically the formation of the earth um, from a water world initially down to the current state that it is in. And then I, I was surprised to bump into this thing called the Zanclean flood, which is like 5 million years ago, where um, the, the strait like on the far left over here, mm -hmm. uh, Basically, all the Mediterranean had dried up, and then this sudden flooding where it started to fill the Mediterranean, and then w the water actually actually flowed down into the Persian Gulf area, like down in this direction. So it, it gave me the impression that 
this would be a low-lying region if water is flowing down this way. Mm. And so that this would be a higher elevation over here and up, up here as well. So then I was thinking, okay, um, based on your work, based on also biblical scholarship work of where Eden would be located, so roughly, say, around here, I'm thinking, okay, and, and the Noah's Ark like, lands roughly up here, that, that means if we have a, a reverse effect, meaning the water from the Indian Ocean filling up this way, then surely the happenings of everything in Genesis is going on in this, in this location. So that's mm -hmm. what I decided to do was, and now this is using your work where I, um, uh, I, you know, I use your work to demonstrate that human migration from East Africa into the Arabian Peninsula is, is the result. And these are quotes from your, from your study. Um, and then I go into the tools that were found in these regions. Uh, which is what you were describing. I even talk about s some genetic evidence about uh, the age range of of the, uh, you know, basically modern humans, how far back do they trace? Yeah. Um, and so this is, this is again taken from your paper, this particular screenshot. Um, and then, and so, so is this one over here. And then... If I scroll down. Ah, so then I, I write here. I came, I came across a 2015 paper titled The Geomorphological and Hydrogeological Evidence for a Holocene Deluge in Arabia. And he says this happens between 13,000 years ago and 8,000 years ago. That's his, and which, which coincides with very similar ages you were giving anyway, like of, of the monsoon and, and... Well, here you've got... Um, so when, when the filling happens after the last ice age, there are period... They're, they're called meltwater pulses. And okay. I, think there, I think there's four or five meltwater pulses. So it, it, it's, it's a staccato process where you might have a few thousand years where not much is filling in, and then suddenly... Um, you know, a giant uh, glacier dumps into into the North Atlantic uh, you know, for whatever reason, and, and and suddenly you just get this you know period where it's it's rapidly warming up, and or some tipping point has happened, and and and, and the sea levels are coming up pretty quickly. So mm -hmm. there are three or four of these meltwater pulses, and, and the the between thirteen and eight, the latest, uh, the one that I think is 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 the one where we end up getting a story about it is. Uh, the final inundation, which which I would put a bit later, um, and the the reason I would put it later is because we have a, a destroyed civilization, because we have a just a civilization around the Gulf that disappears um, mm, okay. right around that time. Um, so, do you can you is this a clear image for you? Like, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, so, according to that study, that twenty fifteen paper. Um, the image at the left, so this is, by the way, this is Hugh Ross's, um, uh, now Hugh Ross is not, a, is not aware of the study because he wrote the book before the study was published. But I, um, after I gave him the paper, because I interviewed him, by the way, and he then uh, took the details of the paper and did a modification of the, of the graphic. So on the, on the left here, would be your typical Pleistocene sort of, you know, there's no Persian Gulf mm -hmm. water. Like the, the, this would be where your oasis is that, that you, you describe. Um, and then according to that paper, this would have been the extent of the flood at its maximum, theoretically maximum. It may not have been this big, but mm -hmm. this is, may, it may have looked like this. And then when the water recedes back in, now we have the present day Persian Gulf. So if the Garden of Eden is located, say, roughly here where my mouse is, mm -hmm. and we have water filling in like this way, that means notice that up here you have Mount Judy and, and the mountains you were talking about where Noah's Ark rests. And that would make sense. The Ark would have been pushed up, or in this case, the reed boat would have been pushed up and it would have rested around there. Now, so I, I, have you come across any of this sort of? 
So I, I argue the I would argue the other direction. So because you know, if this is it's all conjecture. I, I think yeah, we, yeah, we, we right. have so little. It's an educational guess. Yeah. But 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 adding the the layer of if, if we take it as a cyclone, we take the the that this flooding is it's they're getting hit in all directions. The rivers are coming down. The the um, you know Tigris and Euphrates are probably swollen with, with dumping water down there. The aquifers are are exploding. The the um, you know it's just a classic series of flash floods like you get in the Arabian Peninsula today. Right. Um, it's pushing the other way. And, 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 and again, if you go back to the oldest version of the myth, the, the, the um, Eridu Genesis, it, it, it ends with that line where, where it says that the, the, the ark comes to rest um, in the direction of the sunrise um, in the mountains of Dilmun. So, so some east, southeast in the mountains of Dilmun. And Dilmun okay. is, is, is southern Arabia, southeastern Arabia is Oman. So, again, I, I see, you know, because I'm, I, I would go back to the earlier versions of the story for, for getting the geographic place names, um, I, I'm much more inclined to believe them when they, when they talk about Dilmun um, than, than when they talk about going north. You know, getting a boat north into Mesopotamia is a lot less likely than it is south, down, you know, essentially just following the currents as they're washing him out through Hormuz and then and then onto the coast of, of Oman. And the other thing is, in the earliest versions of the story, gets and I think uh, I don't know what he burns in the Bible, but but he's burning incense. Incense plays a major role in the altar that he constructs as soon as he gets off the boat. Right. And that's one of. I mean, one of the things I, I, I did was took the elements that get repeated. Um, you know, took out the, the, the anything that appears one time or, you know, any of the little incidental, but the themes that just, just keep getting repeated over and over again, like the dove, for instance, that's mm. in every version of the story. And that altar is in every single version of the story where he gets out, constructs some kind of an offering you know, device, and, 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 he's, and he burns an offering, he burns incense. Um, Oman is the only place where he's going to get incense. Mm. So, so for me, that's based on the little we know um, where that story is set, and and also knowing historically what happened after four thousand BC when when um, Oman go. Um, um, Rises up again around 3200 BC. They they reestablish a, a prospering civilization called Maga, who become international traders across the Indian Ocean because of their advanced seafaring technology. Right. Interesting. And, and yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna end up with this. Um, you know how you were talking about the species, and I when I mentioned Job. Mm -hmm. So this 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 slide was basically. Uh, Uz, like you know, where's Job located and where's Uz mm -hmm. located? So it's a question mark, but the point is, in Job, you have a list of ten particular species. Which, and then what I did was, I was like, okay, is there a, is there a, a Arabian, you know, like during the mm -hmm. Holocene era, um, well, the early Holocene Holocene era of of depictions of the type of species in this region, and sure enough, a 2016 paper titled "Rock Yeah, the, yeah, 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 that one. Yeah, that's a great paper. And so then I coincided the list of species in Job, which happens to be the species mentioned in the in the flood story, with, with the Hebrew words there, and there's a direct correlation. And so therefore, we're not talking. And the reason why I'm, I'm even bringing this up is because. There were no dinosaurs on the ark because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm tackling the young of creationist, uh, you know, argument. But, I, but, but that's, that's what I'm bringing. Yeah. More so than that, I think is 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 when you look like we were saying earlier, we we, we were discussing is when you look at that story. What is what is so I find it just so gratifying and so cool about about. When, when you look at the original versions, they're just going on and on about domesticated animals 
and 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 you really get the sense of how important domesticated animals were and then you have to mm. yourself project back in time to to, to the world 8000 BC when there were no domesticated cows that was it this was the only place in the world you had domesticated cattle and mm. they're the most you know just just useful beyond measure in you know, in so many I mean, cows just producing resources left and right firewood you know the, the, the cow dung is incredible the door mm. firewood um, labor um, uh, milk it, it just uh, it, revolutionized is part of well it's part of the neolithic revolution this is how the arabian peninsula became to came to be so populated as densely as it was and i think that this this is that story of cain and abel um Kabul and Hubble. i mean how many accounts do we have of brothers who do not get along and who practice different subsistence strategies all right right um, you know, living side by side and you see it in the genetics you've got all you know all males of, of Middle Eastern descent, either belonging to J1 or J2 uh, of these, these haplogroup families. J2 mm -hmm. is everybody in, in Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, Iran, and all the farmers. They're the J2s. The J1s are all the pastoralists. They're the people in low rainfall areas that, that were making a living off of, of herding animals. And, you know, this is what I was saying earlier about, about Judaism is all the Kohanim lineages, it's all J1. It's all Arabian cattle herders. Right. Or, right. Or goat herders. You know, when, they, when they got their act together and realized goats uh, were, were, were a lot wiser choice than, than cattle <laughs> in subsistence. I always think about the Abraham story because that's about when they were switching over to goats. Uh, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I actually, uh, okay, you, you, there's just so many tangents um, in the sense that we we can go on and on with, because I'm thinking of the Jacob Laban thing and the sheep, um, where there's a paper describing, because Christians are like, or even atheists or skeptics are like, you mean to say that uh, the sheep got spotted and, you know, that the fur color was changing because they just observed bark or like, or like, the branches that was placed in front of them when the text very interestingly says that um, the branches were stripped and then placed into the water trough and they've because of epigenetics now um, the chemicals that were leached into the water so while they were mating the the chemicals that they would drink that the the female was drinking would cause that genetic mutation to take place and then that's why the different fur colors arose um, right yeah so i just wanted to throw that in there just yeah I, I can send you that paper if you want on that yeah yeah i love this stuff mm. absolutely please do all right um any last words jeff and also lucas <laughs> i probably said more than enough i yeah. I'm supposed <laughs> to answer questions <laughs> um yeah, I, I, yeah. You don't want any last words because then I'm going to get started on something else. And okay. Then you guys are never going to get a rest. The, the as far as questions go, the outside chat. I don't think they. I mean, I think they've just taken back and just enjoyed the discussion. Um, I think the questions we had was around pretty much. We've, I think we've covered a lot of the questions we already had anyway. Um, I appreciate you clarifying. And, and in a way, correcting certain things as well. Um, I mean, keep in, keep in mind, it's all, everything is just constantly a work in progress. So I'm never, yes, you that, know, that, it, that's the key point I'm making. Yeah. I stand by uh, nothing I've said tonight, <laughs> and I reserve the right to change my mind tomorrow. Right. So, but at the same time, I, I, I guess, okay, let me put it this way. I guess the final word you can say is, and, and, and be bluntly honest. Mm -hmm. Have I and Hugh Ross or the the scholarly Christian community that's that's seen your work and other people work as well, but this collaboration of all the data, especially in light of a positive defense of the biblical story, would you say that you're you've been pleasantly surprised and appreciative and um, that we are on the right track 
and we yeah. haven't misrepresented the data. Like, is that is that your Absolutely. takeaway from this discussion? Absolutely. I mean, keeping in mind, I, I haven't been in the U.S. or, or teaching, you know, in, in this sphere in, in 10, 15 years. But when I, last time I was teaching, I was I was up against create young earth creationism. Right. And so, I mean, in, in a lot of my teaching style developed out of that, of, of trying to take what people knew and then build off of that. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we are so far past that, uh, having that, that to deal with that obstacle of the young earth, um, in that we're actually talking about these tangible issues and you know now it's just a matter of is it, is it up here or is it down here is it seven thousand years ago or is it eleven thousand years ago it means we're really zeroing in and i think we're all on the same page and just trying to figure out who are we and how did we get here and, and, mm. and, and the key is 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 it, it, I, i'm a huge douglas adams fan you know the, the cynicism, the you know every, everything. I, I I quote him all throughout the book. You know, anywhere I can I can get in a Douglas Adams quote. And he's got this great observation about humans where he says, "We're peculiar in that we're the only species that has the ability to learn from our mistakes, and yet completely disinclined to do so." Hmm. And and that's and the it, book of Ecclesiastes, right there. The whole book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean. All of this, all of these, these books, and, and I, 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 I'm, climate change is on my mind because it's, it's the one that's so pressing right now that, you know, I think about why am I even doing research if nobody's going to be here in 50 years to, to read any of this stuff or to follow any of these threads. Yeah. Um, but in fact, this research has an applicability for, for modern times because this research is very much, um, you know, when you understand the stories in the Torah and in, in the Quran in this context, and when you when you look back at, at prehistoric Arabia, um, at the stories of our our earliest ancestors who were struggling with all of these issues, um, we find the roots of all of not all, but we find the roots of so much of our modern suffering, problems of status, of, of income inequality, of, of nutrition, of mm. Um, being disconnected with the earth of, of uh, a lack of purpose. And it all goes back to this, you know, eating the apple or the fruit of knowledge. And it all goes back to that one moment in the garden, which we've talked about is, is metaphorical, metaphysical, whatever, however you want to look at it. But that, that is an inflection point in human history. And, and we haven't recovered since then. And we still need to work on it. And having this discussion like we did tonight, um, and, and people thinking about this research and going back to the Bible and, and, and Torah and going, all right, let me think about it from this perspective and, and, and making the world a little bit better place today as a result. Um, yeah, it, it, that's the goal. I, uh, that's, that's a big amen from me, yeah. And, <laughs> and Lucas, what, any last words as well? I, I know we went way over time as far yeah. as we I'm afraid to, to even look. I haven't even. I think they all, they left without me. I haven't even heard anything <laughs> outside. I'll I'll find them. But don't I'll worry. Like, my channel is known for having literally hours. Like I up. I purposely upload. What I do is I tr I take all the lectures. I hate YouTube videos that are like ten parts, and you have to keep yeah, clicking yeah. on the video. I just and put it all in. Find where's part four next? Yeah. Yeah. I guess. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. I'll be going over this several times uh, this whole thing just trying to you know re recapture everything that was said and so it's just there's a lot to take in on this the, with this discussion and there's a lot that can stem from this like you guys were gonna all, almost went into the whole exodus thing so no no <laughs> let's just keep that you know let's keep that for another discussion and all that yeah but I hope that this is a, a great uh, like first contact uh, between uh, you, Jeff, and uh, the Sentinel Apologetics community, and possibly even more collaboration with other scholars. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm. Let me know because for me now, public outreach is is is, is the number one thing I, I need to be focusing on. I mean, I'm not finding more old stuff. But taking all the old stuff and, and making it uh, useful to 
to weather the storm as it were. So it, I'm happy to be involved and just you know, feel free to reach out anytime if you've got any more questions, if you want to do this again and tackle Exodus, uh, you just let me know. Do you have a Facebook account or do you? I didn't. I disappeared off I, I, off social media. I've been okay. leaning off for the last year. So I, I, I used to have Instagram. I'm off of that now. So really, I'm, I'm kind of hidden away at the moment. Okay. So yeah. maybe, uh, I don't know, I guess you guys can uh, give each other email addresses or something. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm email, academia. Um, I, that's my one kind of social, if you want to call it social uh, okay. uh, media profile, is on academia. So, yep. yeah, I'm, I'm, I lurk on there. So you can, you can, we can continue this and, and plan the next conversation. Okay. And I can actually answer questions next time. So what I'll, <laughs> so what I'll do is I... You know what would be a, a smashing hangout, Lucas? If I have... Heiser with Huros and Jeff. Can you, <laughs> well, because, we've already seen Heiser and Huros together. But that was, yeah, but you see, that'll be... Because Heiser would be the biblical linguist in the sense. And Huros would be the scientist. And right. obviously Jeff as well. Um, I mean, that, that could be a little bit more of a... Because, because because the one thing that Heiser disagrees, so this is for Jeff, for, for you to understand, because Lucas and I are kind of like realizing that there could be like a like a roadblock in that in that discussion. So Q Ross is what you call a concordist, where he sees modern science in the same ancient text. And kind of like what we've been doing anyway, like we've we've been looking at this ancient text or just the, the text generally in the ancient Near East and sort of seeing that it does actually comport with an actual reality sort of situation all those years ago. Um, but Hugh Ross basically says the most accurate ancient text is the Genesis account. Michael Heiser, purely trained in an ancient Near Eastern framework, will say that um, Genesis is not communicating science. It All it's doing is communicating a particular cultural view of the world. So an ancient Near Eastern cosmology, that sort of thing. But Heiser will at the same time not deny the historical events of that. It's just that it's communicated in, in that archaic language. Um, so basically, he, Michael Heiser disagrees with Hugh Ross's concordism. Um, but I'm in between the two of them. So I hold to Heiser's, or pretty much any ancient Near Eastern scholar's view of, of the Old Testament as being deeply rooted in that cultural context. And if God, if there is indeed a God who's communicating through this text, and we were talking about providence, then is it possible that the same text is flexible enough to accommodate a modern scientific worldview? you know keeping it so if, so at one moment if i were to slip myself into the shoes of an ancient israelite i can read the text like an ancient Near Eastern document mm -hmm. if i was to slip in my shoes into a 21st century reader can the text still be clear and applicable to me and not just for that ancient reader but to me as well with this accumulated knowledge of science and based on what hugh ross has written because that's that's what this whole book's actually about is giving a um, uh, like let's 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 see if we can read Genesis just with science like modern science, and he does actually give a convincing argument that like the creation account seems to match chronologically our understandings of the universe. Yeah. So that but you see that's the tension that Heiser and Heros have with each other. But the next time if we have this discussion. Your your area of research is specifically this Arabian Peninsula Peninsula sort of thing, right? The Persian Gulf and yeah. Um, so maybe just Hugh Ross, I think, would be for now the only one that would make sense because the, because he's used your work, and I would love to see Hugh's reaction to your updated uh, because you've updated that piece of work, like you've mentioned. Um, 
and you've you've found some new things and i would be i would love for you to hear what you have to share and then see how he reacts to that based on whatever readings he's done recently and yeah so if you've if you've enjoyed our hospitality and the way we've interacted with you absolutely um, i'd love you, this. this is, yeah yeah, Hugh, Hugh himself, he's a gentleman. Like, you you love him, so. Um, all right. Um, Sign me up. Cool. And thanks, everyone, as well, in the outside world, like, outside to this discussion. I hope this has been educational and edifying. I apologize for, for being long, but I don't care. <laughs> I, it's, it's been great. And uh, all right. God bless, everyone. And I'll see you again. Bye, guys. Thank you for having me. No worries.